we'll get started. Welcome to Crossref 2024. My name is Susan Collins. I'm a community engagement manager here at Crossref. Um, for those of you just joining us, earlier today we had part one of our event. Um, that included Crossref updates, some demos, discussions with our community. Um, that session was recorded and will be shared along with the slides. Great. So first up, I wanted to um, go over a few housekeeping items. I'd like to remind everyone about the Crossref Code of Conduct, which we share at the beginning of every event that we run. We want to make sure that this event is safe and productive for everyone that's involved. And we're sure that everyone here is going to respect staff and attendees. But if anyone has any concerns, please do let a member of Crossref staff know. If you'd like to share your thoughts on social media, you can use the hashtag CrossF2024. Um, and if you have any questions during any of the presentation, please use the Q&A box for the questions. It's easier for us to identify and answer the questions there than if they're posted in the chat. Um, and again, the slides and recordings from this session will also be made available. Next. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, our 2024 board election will be coming up at 1630 UTC. Um, and you can see here the board slate for this year's election. Um, so the voting contact for each member account has been sent a ballot from eBallot. If you have trouble finding your ballot or you need to make a change to your vote, please contact Lucy, the email address you see here, uh, prior to 1500 UTC. So let's get started. I'd like to introduce our first speaker for the session, Luis Montilla. Uh, he's a technical community manager and he'll be giving a workshop on the Crossref API. Hmm. All right. Can you hear me? Perfect. Thank you very much, Susan. Welcome, everybody. So today we will be talking about how to make some uh, API queries to retrieve metadata from our REST API. Uh, but we wanted to do in this occasion uh, uh, something that will go beyond the basic uh, kind of metadata operations that you can do with our API. So uh, previously in our last year event, we shared the introduction to how to make these very basic queries, basically using Postman uh, to make some uh, operations uh, with the, the journals, the founders, and the works endpoint. And you can find this presentation in this link that uh, you can find here and that we will be sharing in the, in the chat box in case that you want to go and cover the basic specs. However, you will see that uh, in this case, it's going to be a little bit more dynamic. I will share with you some videos and some resources that I think you will find really useful. Uh, of course, I think it's always good to remember that we are making all of the metadata that we have uh, openly available to the community uh, via our REST API, which you can find in this link that you can see here. This will take you to our main documentation and then you will be able to explore all the different endpoints that we have with the different kind of operations that you can do. Um, we can make a little uh, description of those. So you can see, for example, here, these are the main endpoints. So you can have, you, you can retrieve information about funders, about journals, about works, but also about specific prefixes or also about members or types of works. And then you can see that for each of those, there are several subtypes of content that you can retrieve and you can combine. It's also good to remember that uh, you have three different access levels to uh, our REST API. So this is always uh, public free, it's fully anonymous. So you can just visit this link that I shared in the previous slide and then you can just start making your, your queries. But then we also have the second level that we call the, the polite uh, level of uh, access to the metadata, which is the, the one that we uh, strongly encourage you to use. It's still free. The difference is that you can, you will be providing here your email for uh, easy identification. Um, but in any case, we will use only uh, this information only to contact you in case that there is some issue uh, with the operations that you are doing. Uh, you can include this information in the header of your queries, or you can also include it as a, a parameter, as in the mail to uh, parameter in your in your queries. And just for the sake of uh, just for the information, you also have available the plus level of access, which is a premium service, and this is uh, basically a service where you have extra quality of service and then additional support, and in general, it's giving you a more consistent and predictable experience. And then you also have additional features such as 
the monthly snapshots and priority service rates and also higher rate limits. However, all of the things that I will describe here are easily applied to the uh, free version of the, uh, the public version of the API. So we're going to uh, cover or, or describe two kinds of operations that you can find when you are retrieving uh, metadata. Uh, these two scenarios are basically on one hand, or the first one of, of, of those, is that you are retrieving metadata that uh, it's returned as a very long list of, 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 of results, which is not always uh, easy to handle. And then you will see that uh, the REST API includes a series of safety mechanisms just to avoid uh, creating uh, issues for the uh, in terms of the stability of the system. And then I will show you how to make, uh, how to navigate throughout this long list of results. And the second scenario will be, uh, oh, sorry. The second scenario will be uh, the operation where you have to collect uh, or retrieve a lot of metadata, but then you will be uh, changing a single variable with different values. So for example, for just for the sake of an example, Let's picture that uh, you want to retrieve journal metadata, and then you have a list of ISSNs, and then you have to make repeated operations only changing these ISSNs. So uh, for the first one, we are going to refer to this as pagination uh, operation. So as I was saying, you have too many results. Uh, when you do this uh, query to a REST API, you will see that uh, in general, the, you will get only a single page of results, and then this will be limited to uh, a 20 results in this uh, in, in the response. Uh, and the way that we we will handle this is by including a, something that we will call a, a cursor in your operations. Uh, you will see here the, the, the spelling. And then th this is basically a pointer that will divide our results into smaller sections, smaller chunks that are more manageable for you. And you can picture this basically as a sort of bookmark that you can use to navigate throughout your, your results. And then the, the operation, it's basically the, that you will get your response and then all of those will include this cursor. You will see how, how it looks very soon. And then you will have another series of results until you reach the final page of the that contains everything that, that you were looking for. This is more uh, the basic logic behind uh, these operations. So you will make a get request to obtain metadata from us. And then you, from here, you will get a limited number of, of results as I was mentioning, but then because you will be including this cursor, I will show you soon how it looks. Uh, this uh, page with limited results will include a cursor, which is basically a string, a series of, a sequence of characters, alphanumeric characters that will, uh, point the system or indicate the system where to continue towards the next results. And then you will use this to navigate through a page after page. So when you do this, uh, for example, if you are doing a simple, uh, a simple request, uh, you have to include this parameter that you can see here, cursor equals the, this asterisk. And uh, with that, the system will be able to return you if there is uh, more results that it, it should handle, then it will be included at this pagination. So I will show you, uh, can you please confirm that you can see a, a video here? Perfect. I'm going to show you how it looks in action. Uh, assuming that you are writing a script that lets, lets you do this for you. Uh, these kind of operations usually are not done by hand, so you have to write uh, a script in a coding language that lets you navigate through these results. So I'm going to click here. And then what you see here in this environment, it's basically a Jupyter notebook that contains uh, some very simple operations to, uh, to, to get these results. You will see that we are installing some three simple R libraries to handle this thing. And then what you see here in the center is the base URL that we are using. So you can see it's api.crossref.org. And then we are going to retrieve metadata from the works endpoint. We are going to execute this. And then you will see here the series of operations that we are doing 
one after the other. So as you can see here, we are building a query and then we are adding the mail to parameter to make sure that we are uh, being redirected to the polite pool. And then we're also modifying our query to retrieve metadata works that specifically include an uh, ORCID ID. So in this case, we are going to execute this. Let's wait for one second. And then I'm including here this, I'm returning two specific elements of the, of the response. So you can see the, the point that we were, we are going to arrive. So I'm going to retrieve the total number of results and the items per page. So when we did, do we do this, you will see that we have uh, over 15 million of results, but then each page contains only 20 results, which this is why we need to include this cursor to be able to navigate throughout this uh, number of results. Now we're going to make the operation including the cursor in our in our query. Once again, notice that uh, we are making a little bit more specific uh, query. In this case, we are requesting also uh, results that include references and notice the indexation date, which is basically uh, everything that has been indexed since October 2024. And then also note, oh, yes, notice here that at the very bottom we are including our cursor, which is going to be highlighted here. Now we are going to execute this. And with that, we should be able to obtain our results. Uh, of course, this is not going to, the intention of this uh, demo is not, uh, to, not to delve too much into the technical details or not to explore the code. But basically here, what I wanted to show you is that uh, when we are writing these scripts, we are including a variable to add, iterate throughout the cursors. And then we are specifying here in the response also, or in the script, sorry, uh, how to call the cursor that is returned in the response, which is in this case, it's it's a part of the message that it's called next cursor. And also the very bottom, uh, just for the sake of the demonstration and to keep it short, uh, we are going to retrieve only three pages of the results. So when we execute this, you will see that we will get some progress bar to let us know uh, when the, the script is finished. And then after a few seconds, it's going to stop. And then we will know that we have all of the responses. And then now we examine this variable that we created where we sort the different responses. And we see here that uh, we got a successful status code, the 200 code. We have the size of the response and it's stored as this list that uh, it will be much more manageable for us in the software that we are using to process all of this. So that's more or less the logic behind that. Uh, but then probably you're wondering, well, what do I do with that list? I'm going to show you uh, the next step with the uh, second operation that I wanted to discuss today. Uh, oh, sorry, let me stop this. Uh, there you go. All right. So uh, I'm also going to make a pause here to discuss other uh, stability uh, recommendations that we that you can find in our uh, documentation, other things that are good to remember. So uh, this is taken directly from our, our documentation. You can see when you start exploring this, you will you should be able to find this message. So in, in general, instability in our APIs uh, can be tracked down to uh, issues in these scripts that we are writing. Uh, Often they can be complex or inefficient, especially when we are starting to build our first scripts and then we don't necessarily, or we haven't read throughout the, the all the entire documentation, so we don't know the best practices. Uh, we are making unnecessary repetitions that are triggering errors, or we're also making requests too quickly beyond the, the right limits or just redundant requests. So I'm going to show you now how to make this iteration also considering these uh, important safety recommendations. 
Once again, let's remember the example that I was mentioning before. We want to retrieve journal metadata starting with a list of ISSNs, for example. And I'm going to show you the overall logic behind this before uh, showing you how the, the script works. So basically what we are going to do is build a script that takes each and every one of those ISSN from our list. Then we will build a get request, including the ISSN that from the list before. If we need it, we are going to modify it, adding extra parameters, for example, in, uh, making it a polite request, including our, our email. And then this is the very important steps where a step we're going to include uh, add a delay that it's going to uh, include a pause between requests to make sure that we are not going to uh, overpass the 50 requests per seconds that are allowed in the public uh, API. Notice that, and this is once again, I want to stress this uh, as much as I can. Um, if you don't pay attention to these things, probably you will be, uh, we will block your IP. So make sure that you're reading throughout all the documentation and then including all of these safety mechanisms. And finally, once we include the delay, we will perform the request and then we should be able to get our results. So I'm going to show you now, once again, with a short video, how it looks like in, in action. Once again, we start from the same set of libraries. And then here in the center of the video, you will see uh, an artificially created list of ISSNs. This is just for the sake of uh, the demonstration. There is nothing in particular with this uh, selection. When we execute this, we are making sure that we are retrieving the list of ISSNs. Uh, you can imagine that you are starting with a probably with a spreadsheet containing a longer list or a CSV file or something like that that you will need to upload to your environment. Actually, I'm adding there a code that you can use as a reference. And then here I'm adding step by step the series of the, once again, the progression. And then notice once again here, this parameter where I'm specifying this delay that I mentioned before. So in, in this case, you can see this as a fraction. It's because we are uh, being extra specific that we are making uh, no more than 30 requests every 60 seconds. That's the key part. When we execute this, we will get the list of requests that we are going to make. However, we haven't retrieved anything yet. It's just the list with the specifications. Notice that here in the where it says policies, it's including this uh, throttle delay. And then now that we are sure that we are not going to overload the system, we will execute this in a second. Yes, we can scroll down and then we're going to perform this. Also, you will see this progress bar very soon. We're going to make the uh, iterations. And after that, it will be completed. We are storing our results in that variable that I'm calling, in this case, my item. Let's retrieve only the first result. And then you can see that this is basically the structure of a JSON file. This is only the first element just to make sure that we are retrieving the correct information. And as I was saying in the, in the previous example, uh, of course, uh, we don't always want to make operations with the JSON file directly. We want to turn this into, for example, a table or a more digestible format. So I'm including here a piece of code that, once again, it's not the purpose of this demonstration, but uh, just bear with me. It will turn the JSON file into a table that is going to make the operations easier. So if you see the last piece of code, then you will have this interactive table with all of the uh, elements of the journal, the, the journals we were retrieving. And then you can use this, for example, uh, to build your own participation reports or a similar tool like that. Of course, if you're wondering how do I build or write all of these scripts, uh, and in case you were not here in our previous session, we are including many of these resources in this new section from website, this learning, uh, the Le Crossref Learning Hub. Basically, we're aggregating here 
all the different kinds of training material that we have been preparing. So you can start interacting with our API with your own hands. You have from very basic examples to more uh, advanced operations like the one uh, I just showed you. And then you can just find the scripts there and then you can just copy them, modify them. And yeah, we just want to uh, give you the tools so you can interact with the API. And with that, I will finish my presentation. I will leave you once again, the links to our documentation, also to the learning hub, the community forum, in case that you want to give us additional feedback or suggestions or requests about specific training material. And in case you want to contact me directly, this is my email. And thank you very much. Is there any question? I did have one, Lisa, in the Q&A. Uh, Margaret asked about um, a question about the scripts. Mm -hmm. um, she just asked for clarity. The user needs to know the script. Well, th this is, let's say, a intermediate level of operations. Uh, it's always good to have some experience with these scripting languages. Uh, we we can provide for sure some uh, interfaces to like make this easier, uh, but yeah, probably you will need for, for probably to cover just the basics with the previous session, just to understand more or less how these operations works, and then uh, return to this other material to to understand how uh, the scripts work. Once again, these are also very simple scripts. I'm trying to simplify the operations. Uh, basically because we don't want you to uh, start learning necessarily how to make a how to make a program we just retrieve the metadata so we are providing the the code for you but yeah it's it's probably that you will need some basic level of uh, familiarity with these languages uh, however you don't have to be tied with a specific language the examples that i just showed you uh, are in the r language but you can also use Python, you can use Julia, you can use uh, other tools. Also, if you don't want to use a specific scripting language, you can use, for example, Postman, which is a graphic interface that is much more friendlier. Uh, so yeah, it's for sure you will need to uh, add a little bit of extra effort in there, but, uh, and also you can, for example, get in touch with us, and then we can try to help you to solve any issues if you can if you cannot execute these these scripts. Any other question, perhaps? Please, we just had another question come into the Q&A. Um, mm -hmm. James asked, does the stability issue mention, the stability issue mention impact other API users? Well, yeah, of course, that's that's the thing, right? That's why we are making sure that uh, the system is stable for everybody. Uh, in general, these limits are very generous. So uh, if you are making simple operations or you are taking care of uh, including all our, our recommendations, uh, your operations should be fine. And once again, that's why we also provide the premium service in case that you are building some uh, application or, or you've got like a, a higher uh, rate limits, you can explore that other service. But yeah, that's where we want to make sure that uh, everybody knows the documentation, know the good practices, so the system is available and stable for everybody. I think we might be ready to move on to the next segment of the program, uh, I believe. Thank you so much, Luis, for that informative workshop. Um, Thank you. I'm always surprised by the, the fascinating kinds of information you can find um, from the Crossref API. Um, so I, uh, my name is Amanda French. I am Technical Community Manager for Roar at Crossref, uh, and I'm here to introduce the next segment of uh, the annual meeting uh, in which we'll be hearing about 
metadata developments at Crossref presented by our own head of metadata, Patricia Feeney. So I will share my screen and share the slides and we will um, go from there. All right, thank you, Amanda. Great. Thanks. So, um, yeah, you can go, just go ahead to okay. the next slide. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so, um, as some of you know, we haven't really done many uh, metadata schema releases lately, but we do have some things coming out next, which is kind of exciting. Um, we are um, in the process of merging our funder registry into the RAR registry um, in, um, with, the, with the aim of um, eventually getting rid of the funder registry and just having all of, all of those identifiers managed by the RAR registry. So obviously, um, for those of you who supply us with funding metadata, we'll need to uh, allow you to register your uh, ROAR, ROAR identifiers instead of funding funder identifiers. So that is something we will be uh, supporting very soon. We are in the, we've done a lot of the work for that already, um, and we are in the process of testing that. Um, so uh, just for those of you who are, who are interested in how that is going to go and how that will Impact, impact you. Um, we have two fundamental metadata schema. We have one for grants, one that captures everything else. Um, it, it encompasses content and data and protocols and other non-grant objects. So everything except for grants. So in our input schema, we'll be able to accept ROAR IDs wherever funding IDs are already accepted. So if you register funding metadata, you won't need to move to a new version of the metadata schema, that's kind of a weird thing. Um, and if you want me to go into more detail about that, I can at some, at some point, if you want to just accept that as a good thing, you can also do that. Um, <laughs> and this change will also kind of reflect a little bit of, of a switch in thinking about how we um, accept some identifiers and metadata in, in in our schema, excuse me, I've got a little frog in my throat. Um, I know we uh, matching was maybe discussed earlier in the morning when I was asleep. Um, we have in the past collected funder names with funding data for matching purposes, but we explicitly don't want to collect a name when a ROAR ID is provided. This is because providing a name with an identifier is redundant. Um, the name is present in the ROAR record that can be easily retrieved in the RAR API, which should be the authoritative source of the name metadata for that funder. So disallowing a name prevents ambiguity. That's a big point of persistent identifier metadata. <clears throat> so I know some metadata users prefer just having name strings in the metadata because it is, you know, it's easier just to pull that down all at once. Um, but we, we think this will prevent metadata issues in the long run. And in long term, we hope we'll be able to um, retrieve that metadata and import that directly into the API from the Aurora API ourselves. But um, for now, we're just um, asking that you not provide the uh, funder name with the Aurora ID when you send it to us. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for grants, uh, we'll be moving to a new version of the grant schema. And with that new iteration of the grant schema will also be accepting the three new funding types, um, APC, BPC, and infrastructure. Um, APC, the article processing charge in particular, has been asked for a lot, as many want to be able to track their funding separately, the funding of APCs separately from overall funding. Um, so we hope that will be picked up by our funding funder mem members. Um, <clears throat> um, and we think it will because they've been asking for it. All right, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, we've also started work on our next next big metadata schema update, um, which is the first in a few years. Um, 
the big update for this is uh, what we're calling type citations. Um, I've mentioned this in a previous update, but I'm going to go into detail on it because we've actually started work on it, which is exciting. Um, so individual citations um, can be submitted to us with article or other um, content types metadata. You can send them to us as a string of text or as a set of tags containing basic citation information. Um, these tags, they kind of support journal and books fairly well, but um, they don't really support other types of content, particularly data citations. So sometimes if you're getting uh, citation metadata from us and there isn't identi an identifier, it's kind of hard to tell what kind of citation it is. Um, and we've gotten a lot of feedback from our members that they do have, um, you know, if you have a list of references, you know what type of reference it is, you know, if it's a book reference, you know, if it's a software citation, you know, if it's a data citation. And a lot of our members are able to send that to us, so we're going to allow you to send that to us. Um, we're also going to add support, uh, um, expand support for versions. We don't currently do a good job of supporting version metadata. We allow you to include relationships between versions, which is very important and highly encouraged, um, but we don't support version numbering. Um, that's kind of a legacy from, we used to only allow you to register DOIs for versions of records. So why would we support a version number? But, you know, obviously we want you to register DOIs for different versions. So we're going to add support for version numbers now. Um, we'll also be adding a version um, description field, but, you know, you can describe um, the version that will be repeatable. Um, with a language tag so you can um, describe that version in multiple languages. <clears throat> we'll also be, be adding a preprints only status field to allow preprints to be flagged as withdrawn or removed. Um, preprints need um, kind of special handling um, and our crossmark update metadata isn't suitable so they're getting their own special element um, just specific to preprints. Um, there are some other more administrative updates as well, just to catch up on some outstanding issues. Um, I'll be putting out some more um, information to go over this in, in detail, um, but just um, there, you know, add, expand our list of media types we support, um, expand the list of archive locations we support. Um, this summer I had put out a, a request for feedback and I got a lot of really valuable feedback, um, particularly on our requ um, request for feedback on support for sp statements on our metadata, which is something we really want to support. Um, but I got enough feedback on that that I think it needs another round of feedback and maybe a larger discussion. So I'm not putting that into this uh, um, schema update, I think we'll have to table, table that for now and put that into a, uh, a forthcoming update after some more discussion. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so back to the um, um, publication types. When I did uh, ask for feedback on the um, citation types, uh, the uh, the list of citation types generated a lot of discussion, so I thought it would be uh, good to just touch on that a little bit. Um, there is a, I think, a really real big need in the community to um, have a comprehensive list of uh, um, publication or content types. Um, there are, there have been various attempts to create one. I know Core has a list. Um, Zenodo has a list. Um, I am not attempting to create that list. That's not Crossref's job. My job, my job is to create a list of commonly used citation types that our members can provide to us. So that's what I've done. And I've tried to keep it very simple um, with the aim to expand this as needed with successive schema updates. So if you see something on this list, if you're if there's a big gap in this list, don't panic because we can always expand this list. So this list basically is comprised of existing crossref record types. Um, 
a few things that are commonly registered with us that we would like to better support in our metadata, but we're not currently able to, but we will be in the future, um, but we're not able to for various reasons. And um, some other things that uh, I think need uh, better identify, uh, identification citation-wise, like data sets, software, patents, and web resources, which is basically web pages and URIs. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so another update we've been planning, which is a big enough update development wise that we wanna break it up into its own update is um, support for the credit taxonomy. Um, I know that's something a lot of our members have been asking for and are anticipating. Um, it's going to take some work on our end, but we're going to do it. Um, Hopefully it'll be out early next year. We've done the metadata planning for the inputs and the outputs. Um, it's gonna take some development work as well, um, but hopefully it, it won't be too disruptive. Um, this is going to, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to support the actual vocabulary. We're going to allow you to supply multiple contributor roles to us. We're also going to add a handful of additional roles to the <clears throat> Crossref vocabulary just because there was a, a big need for those that um, they weren't um, supported by the credit taxonomy, particularly corresponding author. We've got, we've had a lot, a lot of dip, uh, um, requests for that. And also for just a general other um, role. Um, I've also had a lot of requests for some more um, creative roles like illustrators and media roles. Um, but I don't, at this point, I don't think Crossref really wants to get into developing any kind of larger roles vocabulary. So I think we might try to address that in some other way. Um, so stay tuned for more information on that. All right, next slide. <clears throat> so in addition to these things, we've got planned kind of lined up to um, hopefully blow through in maybe the next six months. Um, there are some other things <clears throat> that um, we're currently refining uh, metadata wise. These are kind of on my plate right now. And then I'm going to be uh, working with a larger organization to get these done. Um, that means the, the statements I mentioned earlier um, refining the metadata for that and working with our community to figure out the best way to represent those in our metadata. Um, we've had a lot of requests for my membership to better support abstract mark markup and cleaning bits and onyx and more a more general um, type of non you know non-specific uh, markup for supplying abstracts to us. Um, We've been working with our uh, funders advisory group on expanding the um, grant schema. We've ac actually already worked through a lot of these. So this, this might be coming out sooner rather than later. Um, I think um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, <coughs> they're kind of a, a little head, ahead of, of the curve on is um, being able to expand the language support and all of the the, um, the the text fields within the grant schema because they're they're not dealing with a lot of the the legacy markup that I'm uh, having to manage in the existing input schema. All right, next slide. <laughs> Another update that is also planned um, is I was hoping to fold this into the credit update because I thought it would be a nice theme, but I've decided that it would be just, it would be a little too much development wise and take too much time. And I don't want to hold up the credit update just because it would be cute. That would be done. That would be done. So I decided to roll them up outset separately. Um, we really want to provide better support for single and alternate names, 
like we all know, um, contributors have a wide variety of names. Um, they can have names in different character sets. They don't always have uh, given names and family names. And uh, the crossref schema currently is very rigid about that. Um, so we're going to make that more flexible so we can accommodate all kinds of names. Um, we want to uh, widen the support of contributor identifiers. We uh, widened our support of organizational organization identifiers a while ago. So we want to also widen that support for contributors. Um, we currently support an organization contributor, but not very well. Um, we don't support uh, identifiers for that. Um, we don't support other in information for that. It's just a text string, which isn't uh, a very good level of support. So um, we're going to expand that as well. All right, next slide. All right, finally. Um, one of the things I think we really need to expand, expand support for is multilingual metadata and just language support in general. Our um, metadata schema is really based around the idea that the metadata is supplied to us in a single language and that if, and that maybe there might be one or two translations of the, the item that's supplied and that maybe you can link to the other translation, but it, it's not really designed very well to support the idea that content can be provided in multiple languages or that um, con content can be translated into multiple languages, um, which isn't the world we live in. So um, I want to uh, create a working group to help us better define how we can support this. I think there are some very obvious ways that we can provide support. I mean, obvious, obviously, I think we need to make all of the text fields repeatable. We need to apply language tags to everything. I think that's that's obvious, but I don't want to make assumptions about um, how we uh, support these things. And I think it would be a very good idea to have our uh, members advise us and uh, particularly give, give us an advice on when we should require these things, when we should be flexible and uh, also give us advice on really how to reach out to our community and have our community provide more language metadata to us. Um, and I'm realizing I did not put my contact metadata, my contact metadata, my contact information on this slide. So I'll drop it into the chat, but um, I would like to start this um, working group in a few months. I have a few volunteers already, but I, I, I would like more. So if you're interested, please uh, get into contact, get in touch with me and we'll get started on that. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions either now or um, contact me later. Thank you, Patricia. Um, always fascinating to hear about plans for metadata updates. Uh, to the schema. Uh, we do have one question uh, in the Q&A, and I think Ginny has said she will answer that live. The question is from Natasha Bow, who asks, is there any connection between the funder registry and ROAR? Ginny? Yes, thank you, Amanda. I selected it to be answered live, but I may not be <laughs> the full, have the full answer, but I thought with Patricia and yourself, Amanda, we can cover all the bases. So the answer is yes, there is uh, a lot of connections between the fund registry and raw uh, crossref is um one of the three partners that um oversees raw and um everything that's added to the funder registry now gets absorbed into the raw registry uh routinely and we do have plans to very gradually over time migrate uh the open funder registry to raw and i don't know if that answers your full question natasha but i know amanda and Patricia can probably add some more flavor to that. 
Yes, I just wanted to add that um, I, I will post a link in, I suppose, the chat, perhaps also in Q&A. Um, we have a guide to transitioning from the funder registry to ROAR, and it has lots of links to all kinds of information about how they're related. Specifically, Natasha, to your question about how they're connected, as I mentioned, that um, one good thing to know is that ROAR is about 110,000 organizations. And the funder registry is about, last I checked, roughly 45,000 organizations. And uh, the large percentage of those, um, especially the most used ones of those in the funder registry, are also in ROAR. So there's, there's not an exact one-to-one -one connection, but um, chances are, if you're using a funder ID, that has a corresponding ROAR ID. And then we can always add it if it isn't. Um, so hopefully that uh, that link will help you. I will maybe also put it in Q&A. And um, yeah, feel free to uh, unmute and ask additional questions or let us know if that has, has answered your question, Natasha. That answered my question. Thank you very much Great. for all the links. Very useful. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Um, we did have another question uh, coming in the, the Q&A from somebody who's on mobile, uh, coming in the chat from somebody who is not, uh, doesn't have access to the Q&A. Uh, Sudar Gutam asks, on my mobile, I'm not seeing Q&A, uh, can DOIs of Crossref be identified as preprints? Looking at the DOI prefix, can we identify preprints or journal articles? Patricia, would you like to answer that? Uh, you can't identify it looking at the prefix prefix, but you'd have to look at the metadata. But um, if the if they're submitted correctly, the, um, the the metadata will identify whether it's a journal article or a preprint. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have the whole DOI and you look at the metadata, it should say is preprint yeah, yeah, yeah. is a type, right? Or... Uh, preprint is a subtype of posted content. So you have to you have to look at the metadata record. You can't look at the DOI string itself. The DOI shouldn't have any metadata in it. So you do have to retrieve the metadata record. And Robert du Robin Dunford asks, though for some prefixes you could, for example, archive, which yeah, you can infer. Fair. Yeah. To be sure, you should look at the metadata record. <laughs> Since everything on archive is a preprint yeah. then if it if the prefix is from archive then presumably it's a it's a preprint i think that's a, probably a fairly rare case though because i don't know of any i can't think of anyone else who publishes only preprints but yeah i mean there's a handful of others but um yeah mm -hmm. Prefixes change hands all the time. Yeah. So yeah. it's not a reliable way. But yeah, if obviously archives been around for years, they've been, I think, doing DOIs via data site actually for three or four years, I think. So hopefully they'll keep that prefix forever. Any other questions about um, forthcoming changes to the Crossref metadata schema? Um, Patricia, I think you said you would put your contact info in the chat. Yeah. Um, I am also, uh, especially for questions about uh, ROAR and the funder registry, you can get in touch with me. So I'll put my own uh, email in as well. Um, but only about <laughs> only about ROAR, not about uh, not about Crossref metadata schema generally. Um, we have an offer. Um, we do have a few more minutes before the next segment uh, of the meeting. Um, so we could see uh, a demo from Luis. Luis has offered to give a demo of how to find the content type info in the metadata. Would you Hello. care to do yes. that right now? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, let Great. me share this quickly. Uh, Wonderful. Is it this one, hopefully? Can you please confirm that you can see my browser? Yes. Uh, so yeah, we're going to make a very simple oper operation, not the kind of thing that requires a script. So basically, if we go to our base URL that we showed you before, api.crossref.org, we will enter the documentation. 
But then we have another uh, endpoint that you can use to explore. So if you go to types, you would be able to see the different content types that we have registered uh, in our API in general. But then let's suppose that you want to explore a very specific DOI to see if this is a, a, a journal article or a preprint or something. So that would belong in this case to the works endpoint. So if we just have to add uh, works after the main URL, and then we can add a forward slash, and then we can paste uh, a DOI that we can have at hand. And then we will see the records in this case. Well, we see that it's uh, actually indexed with us. We will see this is the, uh, actually we can collapse this in general. So. Uh, if you don't see this, by the way, it's possible that you need a additional plugin to be able to read this. In some cases, or if perhaps if the browser is not updated enough, you will see something like this. So it's not well structured. Uh, so yeah, if we navigate to the type of work, uh, you we should be able to see that it's a posted content, but then here at the very bottom, you should be able to see an entry that says subtype, and it includes the value preprint. So in this case, we can confirm that this is the case. But also, uh, if you want to use another of our interfaces, you can just go to search.crossref.org. We can input different uh, metadata here. In this case, let's use directly the DOI, and then we will see once again, that it's a posted content. And then if we click here to see the JSON file again, we will be, we will return to uh, where we were before. And yeah, that's two different approaches that you can use to uh, explore the metadata with a specific DOI and confirm if it's a journal article or a preprint. Very nice, useful. I I must say I've never seen that before, so I, I've <laughs> learned something. <laughs> Thank you. Thank um, you. We do have another uh, question in Q and A, and I think this could be for either Patricia or for Luis or both. Um, I noticed Jason uh, Portnoy joined um, after your workshop, uh, Luis. So Jason Portnoy asks: Is there documentation of all the types and subtypes and their definitions? Um, so I don't know whether that would be schema documentation or API documentation. Of course, we do have both. Um, perhaps in this case, it would be more schema documentation. Patricia, can you tell us where we could find documentation of all the types and subtypes and their definitions? Um, yeah, I mean, we have documentation on the website. I will try to dig up the link. Um, I, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, there is documentation of the different um, and a list of the different record types we support. Um, I well, I am going to when we issue the new schema, hopefully, be able to. Um, streamline the documentation a bit it's a it's a little bit of a beast um and hopefully that will involve some more succinct documentations but there there is there are some existing documentations and in terms uh, of just a list of the types yeah. we yeah. did show earlier that we have an entire api endpoint just for types so that lists yeah. all the types that we have and you can use it as a yeah. facet as well to facet works by type and so on i think it's mainly the um definitions we might need yeah and i will say the types in the api the names of the types do not there isn't a one-to-one -one, they don't exactly align with the types record types in the schema gotcha. um luis <laughs> need to add? yeah thank you i uh, just wanted to add something uh, very important for next year but also in the context of metadata retrieval so we are organizing a, an api sprint and metadata sprint where basically we want to have the community be present in a, in a physical space uh, where you can be able to co-create discuss plan projects uh, download metadata uh, 
we will be announcing this soon in our website, but uh, you are learning about it here first. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested in in these kinds of uh, in this kind of spaces where you be, uh, this is going to be happening in in Spain uh, around April. So make sure to uh, keep that in your calendars. And yeah, that that's basically the idea. So working in teams, downloading metadata, working on projects, making proposals, uh, co-creating with the uh, community in general. So uh, also well. Uh, Please monitor our channels because we will soon make the the, announce, the official announcement and we will release the registration form and we will uh, provide many more details about this. Wonderful. Looking forward to that. I love a good sprint. Um, so thanks for that. Um, do please get in touch with me with questions about Roar or with Patricia with questions about the metadata schema or to join the working group. Um, and we'd love to love to hear your thoughts. Uh, I'll now um, pass it over to Cora Korzek, our, our head of community engagement, who is going to talk to you about resourcing Crossref. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm Cora Korzek, uh, and uh, it will be my pleasure to hopefully give you, well, definitely give you an update on the resourcing crossroad for future sustainability research that we have delivered so far, and hopefully also uh, hear some of um, your thoughts on those topics, um, whether you are willing to share your questions, concerns, um, suggestions, or just comments on the matter. Thank you very much for the slides. Uh, so I would hope, uh, no, those are a bit too fast. Uh, I would hope uh, that uh, most uh, people here will have um, a, a, a general awareness of the fact that we are reviewing our fees uh, with a view to make them um, uh, more, uh, well, to keep them uh, to be sustainable, but also make, the, uh, make them more accessible for the, um, to different organizations around the world uh, and to make sure that, that there is a you know, a, a, a fair balance uh, between those who, who contribute and who then use metadata as well. So if we can then now skip to the next slide, thank you. Uh, the, the project has those three general goals um, to make sure that our fees are more equitable among our members and also allowing potential future organizations joining us. Uh, we also have the ambition of simplifying complex fees uh, and uh, we already had some conversations about this this morning, and I wonder whether there will be any more views to share uh, about whether or not the fees are currently um, too complex, not complex enough, uh, or anything in between. Uh, and there's also this notion of uh, rebalancing the sources of, um, of revenue for Crossref. Uh, so, so far, uh, we have um, focused on the equitability of the fees. Uh, and uh, to that end, obviously, our main interest uh, is in our currently lowest tier for publishing members, which is the $275 oh, American dollars per year as a membership fee. Uh, and uh, this tier applies, as it currently stands, to all organizations that wish that join Crossref who have the annual publishing revenue or expenses, depending on their situation, of anything between zero and one million dollars, uh, so uh, it it's not a uh, big challenge to notice that there is a great uh, level of diversity between organizations that have no uh, revenue or expenses and those that have one million US dollars uh, revenue and expenses. Uh, and so we started um, our exploration of this topic and how we might uh, make any changes here uh, by. Um, sending out a survey to uh, 8,000, over 8,000 organizations who are direct members of Crossref. And here, let me just say, um, I think, you know, we'll, you will hear in the state of Crossref probably later on some statistics about membership. So currently Crossref has just over 21,000 uh, organizations as members, uh, but of those 21,000, close to 20,000 are actually um, organizations in that qualify within that first year of $275 per year um, annual fee. 
Uh, but however, it is uh, uh, over just over 8,000 of those organizations who are direct members. Others have joined us with uh, through the support of sponsors, so sponsoring organizations who are paying, um, who act as umbrella organizations for um, for members who, who join through them uh, and they pay kind of a joint fee. So in that particular case, those are the, the members who join in this way also qualify within this, uh, our currently lowest tier for, for publishing organizations. However, um, they may not necessarily be paying the fullness of that fee because it is being um, spread across organizations being supported by the same uh, sponsor. So because the direct members uh, kind of uh, pay the full fees, it was, we felt it was appropriate to interact with them because we know um, a, a bit more specifically uh, what kind of fees they are, um, they are paying to Crossref. Uh, and uh, we've been very lucky uh, with a relatively high uh, response rate in this uh, survey, 13% or 13% of members have responded and thank you very much to, to those who did. Uh, and uh, the graph next to the bullet points, as you can see, is showing um, that the members in um, in the sector of between zero and one million of uh, revenue expenses of their, in their publishing uh, seem to be kind of gravitating towards the lower end a little more. Uh, so we have more organizations uh, between kind of uh, zero and say 10,000 or maybe $50,000 uh, of uh, annual publishing revenue or expenses, and then we might have on that other end uh, closer to um, closer to a million. Uh, and so I think next slide. Excellent. Um, and obviously, if um, if the organization's expenses are lower than the fees that they are paying to Crossref, because the the fee is the same across those, that they will automatically be. Um, you know, proportionally different for those organizations. Uh, but nevertheless, we have asked um, among those members, the direct members that qualify uh, for our 275 uh, US dollars annual fee, uh, how, um, what proportion of their total expenses they pay to Crossref in all the role fees that they pay to us. So that would include the membership fee as well as any registration fees for content they might be registering over the course of the year. Uh, and uh, as you can see, um, well, for the for about a third um, of those members, uh, it was uh, it was less than than um, one percent, uh, less than one percent. Uh, sorry, less than uh, yes. Um, however, there was a, a a large group of uh, of members who in that particular tier. Uh, who said that they are paying um, five percent of or above uh, of their budget or expenses, uh, kind of in fees to Crossref, and that might be for uh, for many reasons. As you can see across the continents in here in this particular graph, the proportion of members, uh, say from Asia, uh, and um, to an extent also to from Africa. Uh, kind of is a bit larger in those in those re, um, sorry in the, the larger in the sections where you can see the higher proportion of fees being paid to Crossref compared to the budget of the organization. Uh, however, the the European and North American organizations are still present there, um, and so are Latin American um, and Caribbean organizations as well. So this is um, something that we need to address across the geographical regions. Uh, but it's uh, but but it is important to note that there are some some regions where this might have more of an effect, especially as we can see here in Asia. And it's important to note that because um, uh, approximately fifty percent of our members are currently based in that region. All right, we can move on. Thank you very much. Uh, and so we have also started consultation about barriers to joining with publishing organizations who are not. Uh, yet yeah, currently members of Crossref. Uh, and this consultation is ongoing. Uh, it is uh, it has proven a relatively challenging exercise because it's difficult to ask organizations you don't know uh, what they think about you. Uh, and it's also not the most motivating thing to do to um, come and uh, participate in a consultation for, uh, of an organization that you are not a member of. Uh, however, we did have a few organizations who have come forward to share their their views and, and circumstances with us. 
Uh, and so far we have learned that there are some technical barriers um, that stand in the way of uh, organizations joining. And in some circumstances, uh, a fee can be uh, also a barrier to joining. However, it is not um, uh, it is not clear what level of the fee would potentially be, um, you know, what level of the fee would be more acceptable for the organizations who have taken part in the consultation and, in, and so far they've highlighted technical challenges. Um, more clearly uh, as a barrier to joining. However, so far we've only had a handful of those interviews and we are still gathering more information. So this definitely is pending more um, uh, further research and further insight into that. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So our next goal is in simplifying our fees. Um, so here you can see the slide that, um, that shows the fee that we have right now. Uh, so take that in. Uh, obviously, there is a few different levels. Uh, you don't necessarily need to memorize it all to be able to take part in the discussion later on. Uh, but I think it just provides a perspective of the fact that there is so many different levels. And at this point, we also differentiate between the funder members and other members. So the other members are meant to be the publishing members. But as we um, will you know, reflect on anyway, uh, one of the problems is that not all of the or other members or publishing members actually have publishing as their key activity and especially not necessarily as their key revenue uh, yielding activity. Uh, and so this this um, causes a bit of a problem. So the next next slide or not necessarily a problem, but definitely a challenge. Oh, OK, uh, I think we've missed a uh, slide somewhere on the way, but that doesn't matter. Uh, so we uh, have here. Um, a benchmarking exercise that um, that we uh, carried out to compare ourselves with a few other similar organizations. So here you can see on the uh, first column, you can see Crossref uh, and the annual membership fees uh, of similar organizations, uh, which, you know, the things like CORE, the OAJ, Dryad, OA Switchboard, Open Citations and ORCID. So as far as we were able to to gain uh, information or insight into how those fees are being set for organizations, you can see um, that there is a level of um, uh, a, a level of um, similarity between those organizations. Uh, and because some of those systems have been around for quite a long time, we see that level of similarity as a, a form of confirmation or at least an indication that those mechanisms have worked for those organizations. And so it is a potential, um, those are potential um, solutions that we can consider in our own uh, kind of ideating of the future fees. So one area of, of, of certain, um, you know, agreement between different organizations is uh, that um, the tier, the, the uh, fee levels are based on annual revenue. Uh, and that is the case for three out of the seven organizations. Uh, as you can see, only one more organization, the OA Switchboard, uh, uses the publishing revenue specifically as a um, as a basis for their annual fees. Uh, and uh, nobody <laughs> uh, of the other uh, people that have, that we have considered uh, is looking at um, kind of annual expenses. Uh, so this kind of just indicates that the annual revenue might be a more more objective or e more easily available measure of the size of the organization and their ability to pay. That obviously comes with a number of caveats. For example, uh, for organizations that have a relatively distributed um, structure, like say some of the research institutions that have um, separate departments, that you know, then you can um, then then it's difficult to to decide who is the the. Who, uh, whose revenue <laughs> is meant to be taken into account as the um, basis uh, for that annual um, ability to pay. So that obviously comes with some level of challenge, but nevertheless, we can see that other organizations have found that as a, um, as a, as a useful basis for setting up their fees. The other thing is that there is a level, certain level of agreement is volume. So the, the um, fees by other organizations, but for other organizations are relating their annual fees to the volume output or, or, or number of um, things that are, that are being uh, presented to those organizations. Um, and so this is something that we are currently not doing and we levy the, the, the transaction fees um, that kind of, um, in a way, in some cases, maybe offset or 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 balance out the, the those membership fees, 
uh, with the volume. However, it is important to note that our, others have found it again as a useful basis for, for setting up their fees. And there is pretty much um, an agreement uh, around uh, providing discounted uh, pricing or fees uh, to countries that have been identified as low or, or sometimes, sometimes low and middle income um, in the World Bank data. Uh, and so Crossroad is also doing that at the moment uh, in a way with our GEM program where um, countries based in um, either countries that, that, that we kind of then select from those that, that we are able to offer the program to uh, and they are um, eligible for joining Crossref at no fees. So basically the, the membership fees is a zero dollar uh, fee and then they also don't need to pay for registration. Uh, and we can see that there is um, a level of uh, discounting fees across other partners, and it's certainly something that we wish to continue um, uh, continue doing in our own future fees. And you can also see the different number of different levels of fees. Um, I'm not quite sure who the winner is uh, of all those organizations. It looks like DOAJ um, is uh, challenging us on the number of tiers across the different types of organizations that they that they work with. Uh, but, uh, you know, there is a level of complexity uh, in all of those, which I think speaks to something that we have definitely discovered ourselves, that the goals of um, providing equitable fees or more equitable fees than we have so far and trying to simplify fees, those two goals often um, contradict each other. So trying to be more um, more equitable uh, seems to be... Uh, Causing immediately uh, a, a, a greater complexity of the fee schedules, uh, but you know we are hopeful we are going to be able to resolve that. Next slide, please. And the final goal is to rebalance our revenue. So, um, we, for those of you who have joined us earlier today, uh, we have heard this morning about you know some new opportunities and the greatest a greater recognition of for the use of open scholarly metadata. Um, you know, across the ecosystem, uh, and we certainly are well positioned to to provide uh, metadata to partners across the scholarly, um, you know, scholarly communications or, or, or evaluation like landscape, whichever one you'd like to talk about. Uh, and the Crossref REST API is and will remain open and free for all to use. I think that there is no, I, I don't think there's been question of, uh, around that at least you know, in the process so far. Uh, we are, however, looking at the Metadata Plus as a paid service um, for high volume use, especially for those external tools that integrate our API. So obviously um, those, um, those users uh, particularly help other organizations meet their, um, meet their um, objectives uh, with the use of, of the metadata that is available in the system. Uh, and and their, um, they have a different, you know, they, they ca cause a different strain, so to speak, uh, on the system potentially. So that's why they have a separate pool for that, uh, for their queries. And then, uh, and they also uh, require a different um, guarantees around the accessibility of the metadata at any given moment in time. And that's the, hence the, the, the um, paid for metadata plus service. Uh, so there is there are questions um, there around whether the users of the metadata uh, are, are able to contribute more or in different ways to the maintenance uh, of the um, of our metadata uh, and and the provision of the of the open REST API as well. All right, so I think that it will be the final slide of me um, talking about the project so far. Please, please feel free to add your uh, add any comments or questions uh, in the chat. If you so wish, you can also use the Q&A, but we'll soon start a discussion to talk about it in more depth. But before that happens, I would love to hear a little more about who we have in the room, because that obviously sets a bit of a context for our conversation. Uh, so if, uh, uh, if you could kind of humor me and um, uh, answer a little poll uh, about who is in the room. So let's talk about fees first. Uh, I presume most of the organizations represented here uh, will be members. And I would hope that 
at least some of you uh, have a level of insight about your <laughs> membership tier that your organization is on at the moment. Um, so uh, you can select from the list here. And not surprisingly, I can see that the um, under a million US dollars uh, tier is in the lead with uh, already more than 40% uh, of our participants in that tier. However, then uh, 5 to 10 million is also going strong. Uh, I can see that under 100 million as represented. Um, there's also something else. We have funders in the room. That's great to know. Uh, and uh, some people um, are not Crossroad members or, and the fees are not applicable to them. Of course, I haven't provided the, uh, here the tiers for, for example, our Metadata Plus subscribers, which is a different uh, level, um, you know, different side of this picture altogether. Okay, we have, uh, uh, we had about half people participating in the poll already. So I'll give you the last 30 seconds or, or, or maybe 20 only uh, to respond to the poll. Uh, Please just me. Uh, this is again, as I say, this is just to uh, set the context for our uh, for our current for our discussion later on, so that we can see from from kind of what perspective uh, people might be coming to the discussion about this. Okay, are we going to get to fifty percent responses? Don't be shy. We just need a couple more. All right. Okay. Well, I will now um, end the poll. And we can share the results. Hopefully you can see the results. Anybody would be able to nod to me to say that whether you do or don't. Okay, thank you, Robin, for the thumbs up. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so as you can see, we have 44% of those who responded. So we have half people in the call have responded to this poll. Uh, and uh, the, the most represented group are the people in the uh, $275 uh, annual fee, um, which is not uh, surprising given that, that the, the structure of our current membership. However, we also have members from the, the other uh, from the higher fee tiers. And like, as I mentioned, we also seem to have a handful of, uh, of uh, funders and non-members on the call. So thank you very much. Uh, all right. Looking at uh, looking at um, the um, who's in the room, uh, the next question that comes to mind is about uh, the use of Crossroad API. So I'm going to launch this poll, which will be hopefully a bit quicker because there's less choices to make. Um, and the question here is, are you or your organization, you know, depending on your situation, using Crossroad API to meet your organization's objectives? So not, ju not just if you're out of curiosity, checking on a DOI or things like that, but kind of is, uh, uh, is using Crossroad um, metadata part of your workflow in one way or another? Uh, and, uh, you know, how, how, how essential it is, how regularly you use it. So as you can see, there is different options of, um, of answers here. You might be a Metadata Plus subscriber and uh, we welcome a handful of those. Uh, also, uh, we you might not be a subscriber, but you might still be using the free cross Crossref API regularly. And that seems to be the larger group so far. Um, you might also, also only be using it sometimes. And then um, you might not be uh, using Crossref API at present. And the other thing is that from the position where you're in, uh, you might not know whether your organization is using that. Okay, well, this poll is definitely more popular. We have already 60% of people uh, sharing their uh, position with us. So I'm going to end the poll here and share the results. Uh, so yes, as I've mentioned, uh, the largest group here are the people who are using the free Crossref uh, API regularly. Uh, and those who don't use it at all. However, there are other, uh, others as well, um, including um, seven uh, Metadata Plus subscribers uh, and uh, some occasional users of the Crossroad API, as well as um, uh, a dozen or so of those who aren't sure. Okay, excellent. You'll be pleased to know that I only have one more poll for you uh, to respond to. Uh, so let's get on with the next slide and hopefully I can find a poll on my, uh, on my screen here. Here we go. Uh, so finally, I, you know, this kind of uh, goes back to that thing about the basis of our fees. And I did talk about the fact that not all organizations that are Crossroad members even, you know, have publishing activity as a revenue um, winning exercise. 
And I'm wondering, um, you know, in here, can we get full context uh, if some of you could tell us whether publishing activity uh, is a primary um, thing for your organization to do? And uh, so far, uh, we have 45 people uh, voting. So, yeah, I'd like to get us to at least 50 percent to get some more representative uh, rep uh, representative sample. And yes, oh, well, the results are coming in. This is also the shortest poll, so I think that also speeds us up a little. And we're getting there. Okay, fine. All right. Well, more than 60%. Okay, I'm going to end the poll now. So we can share the results. And uh, I think it is relatively, um, you know, a clear <laughs> result. Not all our members and certainly not people on, on this call uh, have publishing uh, scholarly content as their primary activity, um, uh, let alone as a as a primary kind of source of revenue. So this is important things to keep in mind when we move on to our um, our questions for discussion. All right. Before we move on, there is a question in a Q and A. Oh my goodness, there is uh, more questions coming in the Q and A. Uh, so. I think what I'd like to do, if this is not a problem, uh, Robin, I wonder if you'd like to just ask your questions um, directly and then we can uh, engage with that. Sure. Um, my question was really about your slide where you're talking about the REST API versus Metadata Plus and, and Metadata Plus being for high volume use. What is high volume use? Is, it, is there some kind of cutoff or is the REST API just going to get kind of slower and slower or get throttled if you try and throw too much stuff at it? That means it will become unusable if you're too high a user. All right. Thank you, Robin. Um, there, I'm, I'm not sure if there is a straight cutoff. I think, Louis, you were talking about um, the uh, limits of the pools at the moment. Uh, basically, what happens when you subscribe to the um, Metadata Plus service is that, you know, there there is less strain on that specific pool, uh, and so the the limits are even less. But I wonder, Lewis, would you be able to uh, jump in and support me in responding to to things about the high volume use? Would we recognize as such? Yeah. Of course. So yeah, I think uh, one of the main uh, characteristics here is that the red limits that you would have in the public uh, API. So it, it, uh, for the pub, for the, sorry, Metadata Plus, it will be three times higher. But then also I would like to highlight that uh, even if you don't need to become a, a Metadata Plus subscriber, we also have a public data file that contains the entirety of the metadata uh, for, in a given year that you can also use in case that you need like high volumes of metadata and then uh, you perhaps the size of our operations are not high enough to become a Metadata Plus subscriber, you can also explore the public data file to retrieve like these larger amounts of, met of metadata. Thanks. All right, thank you. And thank you, Robin, for asking the question. Uh, and uh, modeling the, uh, you know, the option of uh, taking part in the discussion. Um, so yeah, if we can have the next slide, uh, there are really kind of three questions um, that I think might be useful to gain um, to, to gain your um, you know to gain communal views on. Uh, one of the first questions is kind of the basis for everything else is what is the fairest measure for us to base our ability to pay on? At the moment, as we were talking about it, we are using the um, annual publishing revenue or expenses, depending on. Um, on the organization's circumstances, if they don't have um, publishing revenue, however, they do have expenses, then obviously that is the basis. And we currently have a slightly different um, arrangement for the funders. Uh, so already um, there are many limitations to that um, to that definition. Uh, and I wonder uh, if there are views in the room about that. So we'll spend a few minutes on it, but before we, we focus on a specific question, I will also uh, read out the, the, the other ones that you might want to share your views on. Uh, there is also a question uh, of, you know, are there any views or perceptions about um, Crossref offering lower and zero dollars fees for members in low and middle income countries? Uh, if there are any reflections on that, uh, then please also uh, include them in the in the chat. As I said, the intention currently is that the kind of 
that what we currently offer under the GEM program will continue in the future um, fee schedule. Uh, if there are any comments around this, you know, uh, then, then we would also be very interested to hear. Uh, and uh, finally, what would be a useful set of streamlined discounts to support greater participation in the research nexus? So we currently have um, uh, a number of discounts, some of which uh, get a very little use. Um, all of those discounts, you know, aim at uh, incentivizing participation uh, and completeness of metadata. Uh, and, you know, we'd love to crowdsource a bit more of a um feedback about uh how you see what might be a um, a good set of of discounts that would be um you know supporting that participation even further um so okay yep yeah, thank you there is uh there are some links that have been uh, shared about both metadata plus service uh, and the uh, global equitable membership program uh, in the chat if anybody is interested to explore those in more details uh but uh, currently uh we've got um uh, another um uh 15 or so minutes to to talk about those key questions so uh i would invite anybody who has a view on perhaps the basis for ability to pay as a first instance uh to raise your hand or type something in the chat to um to share your views on what could be the fairest measure for the basis and ability to pay I've seen some representation of um, the Diamond Open Access journals already uh, in the chat. So if anybody, um, I think there is, uh, for example, Patricia here, uh, Patricia Moore has shared the comment there. Uh, if you'd like to um, pick up uh, and, sh and share your views for what could be a useful basis for, um, for uh, membership fees for organizations that don't necessarily have publishing um, publishing revenue. A difference between um, fair and affordable. So um, it we mostly do we mostly register our theses. We run twenty open access fully open access journals that are all diamond. Um, we probably register a thousand a year when you include our theses and dissertations, um, but the cost of membership is not prohibitive, but certainly um, I have to make a strong justification for that every year. Um, and I recognize that I'm coming from a place of very great privilege, but um, it the size of our institution sometimes puts us in a tier that is not consistent with the amount of like we we yes we have thirty thousand students, but we have our you know we only have twenty journals. We we're teeny teeny tiny in terms of the numbers of actual registrations we do, and so it's sometimes seems a bit disproportionate. Um, when I'm making my case to the budget gods. Thank you, Patricia. Yeah, that's a very important point. Thank you for that. Um, I, I, yeah, I wonder, you know, whether you have any reflections on what, you know, what would be more practicable for an organization like yours. Um, in the meantime, I can see that Heather um, Hankins has been sharing some some options here uh, in the chat, as well as Golam Hossein uh, Farahi. So if any of, uh, if either of you would like to come online and, and you know, give a bit more detail directly then uh, I'd welcome them and we have a, a slightly uh, more elaborate um, uh, also piece from Chris Rillen about the fact that you know practically not all potential um, 
measures or, or statistics are available and the, the total budget uh, is something that uh, might be a, just a, a bit more available uh, as a measure for the ability to pay. I'm happy to welcome and views on that. I think from what we were he uh, hearing from Patricia, the total budget might be a bit misleading if it's applied on the higher level of the organization. As I said, some organizations have quite distributed um, structure and then that becomes a challenge. Um, but again, it could be seen as a more objective measure. Lisa. Yeah, I think maybe it would be helpful to talk a little bit about what some of the challenges are with the current model, which is asking for publishing either revenue or expenses, um, because I think that's what we're trying to contrast it against. And it could be that that ends up being the best way to go once all the data are collected from this investigation that's happening right now. But um, maybe just sharing some of the reasons why there's an interest in looking at something other than publishing revenue or expenses. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Uh, so uh, I think that the primary uh, issue here for us is the organizations that don't have that, that basically don't have the publishing um, revenue or expenses uh, in a meaningful uh, uh, way that would allow us to measure them. We would like to potentially um, treat all organizations in the same uh, in the same way. Uh, so the that really um, poses a challenge uh, when comparing you know, standard publishing organizations for whom that is the the, the key activity from those who are um, maybe, you know, whether, whether they are libraries, research institutions, or, or I don't know, perhaps funders uh, who don't have publishing uh, revenue or expenses in that would allow uh, for, for providing a, a meaningful base for um, judging their ability to pay. Oh, it's interesting point from Natasha actually uh, in uh, in the discussion there. Uh, you know, um, I suppose in a way it's in the contrast with what Chris was saying. That, you know, whilst the total budget might well be an, an, a more objective measure, uh, it might not. Um, it it might be that if the what publishing is not the primary, uh, not the primary activity, uh, then um, then the budget might not be assigned in the same way to um, to that particular activity. Okay, there seems to be a bit of a discussion going on in the chat on that point. I'm uh, very curious about what the um, where we get to. I wonder is, if Natasha or Ryan uh, might be interested to just uh, speak to us freely and share with everybody. Uh, yes, if you wish, it's just that in some organization, uh, the budgets are uh, like the budget we have for publishing is included inside a bigger budget, so it's already difficult to to say what we are spending just for publishing uh, in comparison to all what they spend into our department, for example. So it's kind of difficult to to really give a, like a, a really a, what is the measure you you should uh, base yourself on to. Uh, to uh, to assess which kind of fees should be should be given. So, I don't have a solution on that. <laughs> really, it's, it might depends a lot about which kind of institution you are uh, you are talking about. Yes, I I was supporting Natasha there. Um, that um, one of the sponsored clients that we used to have, we don't have them anymore, but they were a large organization. Um, they did specify communication as an activity in the bu in their budget, but that included both scholarly publication involving DOIs and non-scholarly publication. So again, it was quite hard to tell how much of this money actually uh, should contribute towards the 
membership fee. Uh, like Natasha, I don't have a solution either. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> we... No, I don't think we expect a, a, a you know a, a fully baked solution. Sometimes, uh, you know, questions and challenges uh, to a way of thinking uh, is just as valuable, uh, and providing a perspective that you know we might have missed otherwise. Uh, I can see that Samuel Saki Horam has uh, shared a, a well structured feedback in the chat. Samuel, if you'd like to come online and speak to us, uh, then obviously I'd welcome you unmuting yourself and, and sharing this insight. Otherwise, obviously, I can read it out on your behalf, but I think it would be a shame if you have things to, to say. You can say them directly as well. That's all right. I can. OK, well, in, uh, I, I suppose we Samuel may, may not be able to speak to us directly, so that's fine. Uh, he says that we can say that following our resources, growth will provide for sustainable infrastructure development. Uh, those five points, the DOI registration options, metadata depositing, um, and cross of API, research reporting guidelines, uh, and community support, certainly the last one. I'm not exactly sure if I am understanding the fourth point that you are making, Samuel. So if there was a bit of a clarification, I think that would be useful to understand there. All right. So we talked a little bit about the basis for the fee. Um, as we have just a few minutes left, uh, I wonder if anybody has a view to offer about either uh, the um, you know some some form of discounted fees for members in low and middle income countries, uh, or about um, discounts again, but uh, with a specific purpose for supporting greater participation in the research nexus. I certainly saw before some representation of people from the gem eligible countries uh, appreciating the option of uh, of having no fees for their participation. Uh, oh, thank you, Lisa, for sharing the, all the services of Crosser here. Uh, I wonder if anybody has a, has a view to share about um, discounted fees, either for membership or for transactions with Crosser. Corey, there was a question in the Q&A that came through. I'm not sure if you saw it. Oh. All right, great. Thank you so much for highlighting it. I've been busy with the chat and completely uh, ignoring that. Thank you very much. So. Telling Mathy, fee as a function of size or institution, um, percentage or proportion of organization budget for publication, an actual budget for publishing. Um, yes, an average registration over the last five years. I wonder if this is about putting all those things in the bag as a basis for setting up a fee, or whether this is just uh, listing some of those um or whether this is just about uh, listing the different options here is unfortunately an anonymous participant so i can't necessarily gauge but if someone um uh, would like to share a, uh, an option here uh what is being what is being made by feeling mathy uh, and fee having a, a being a, a function of all those um oh yes okay all those combined Yes. Okay. So, as I said, um, equitability stands often uh, in contrast with um, with simplification, and we do certainly appreciate that. Uh, and you know, uh, Lisa, I wonder if you'd be interested in uh, uh, having a bit of a go with a mathematical function that is being uh, suggested here, taking into account all of the things, the size of the institution. Although I think that is the one thing that we are still grappling with, and not necessarily sure how to define it percentage of pro or, or proportion of organizational budget for publications, actual budget for publishing, revenue for publishing, and average number of registration over the last five years. Of course, this is an interesting, um, I think this is an interesting formula, but I, I, I believe there could be others produced as well, depending on which, which side we would be uh, looking at that. Okay, in the meantime, I am now looking at both Q&A and the, and the chat. So I think um, I'm going to take a look at the Q&A Certainly more support for discounts for the low and middle income countries here. Uh, and 
and also a notion that okay, the Solomon uh, Nator uh, from Nigeria uh, says something about the uh, the fact that they charge less than twenty dollars for publication, uh, which obviously means that the I, I presume uh, this means that the that the revenue from publishing is relatively limited. Um, okay, and uh, Natasha has uh, shared a, a list of low and middle income countries uh, for anybody's interest. Very good. We have two minutes left uh, in this discussion. So I am uh, I am grateful for all the feedback. I think we mostly managed to talk mo uh, about the basis for the fee and what is the practical uh, and what might be fair uh, things to base the fee on. And certainly there's been more question and answers. Uh, but that often is uh, when you start a research project. Um, so there is a challenge to the total budget as potentially not being, even though it might talk about the um, the overall size of the organization, uh, whether or not it is proportionate to what the organization is able to afford to to pay for specifically their publishing operation that would that would you know be related to Crossref. Uh, are slightly separate things. There is also a question: Is there an evidence that the current fees are deterring membership? With two hundred new members a month, it seems pretty accessible. That was a question from Stuart. Um, and uh, yes, uh, is the answer. Uh, so as much as we have around two hundred new members joining each month, we receive more applications. And uh, sadly, some of those applications um, don't go through because uh, at the point where the new members might be um, asked to pay their fee. Uh, and to be able to to start their membership, so that is one indication potentially those um, those abandoned applications or, or or those that haven't gone through uh, could be one indication that a fee has been a challenge. Uh, it is not definitive because we rarely hear back from those organisations, uh, but uh, as I said, we, you know it it is um, something uh, that gives us a think about it. And we also have anecdotal feedback from the community where at some events, you know, we do hear. Um, from organizations potentially that, you know, that someone might not be able to join Crossref uh, at, this, at the current level of fees. Uh, so I think that that is the indication we have so far. Most of this uh, is, is kind of anecdotal or, as I say, kind of um, inferred from indirect source um, of, of some of those applications being abandoned. So that's that. All right. Thank you very much for your participation and patience. You had to hear a lot of my voice. I am incredibly grateful to everybody who has gone on uh, and risked it uh, to speak directly with everybody. I know it's a bit of a challenge in a big room. Uh, you know, we do have an audience of uh, more than 80 people. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, I think it's now time for our little break. Uh, and uh, I encourage everybody to to um, grab, a, uh, grab a drink before we join the formal uh, annual meeting. Uh, and learn more about the state of Crossref as well as the conclusion of our board elections. Thank you very much. Oh, um, Cora, I think maybe it's easier if I share my screen just to spare you the slide advancing. Okay, okay can everyone see that? Yes. Lucy, you can hear me fine. Yes. Okay, let's jump in. We have a few things we're going to cover. Um, I'm Lucy Ofeish. I'm the COO at Crossref. Um, and I'm joined by Emily Cook, who is our external counsel um, from Pierce Atwood. And we are going to do our um, so. This whole day is our Crossref 2024, but there is a portion of it as membership association that we have our formal membership, our annual meeting that is described in our bylaws. And 
Um, so there are some formal business we're going to conduct. Um, that includes audience participation, where you will get to vote on resolutions um, and do some of our formal business that'll come in a moment. Um, but as part of the annual meeting each year, we are, um, we also like to give kind of a state of the union of Crossref. Some of this, if you were on the morning session, some of this might be a little repetitive in a different order and with a different person telling it to you, but um, we'll do a bit of a recap of kind of where we are at this point in the year. Um, our financial position, um, we will give an overview on our governance structure as it relates to our um, board election, and then we will go through the results of our board election. Um, if you are just joining us, feel free to drop questions in the chat. Um, I believe the Q&A or the chat, we'll keep an eye on both of those. Um, and when it gets time to kind of the formal meeting, I will ask for motions, um, which will just mean any member, if you are representing a member organization, you can make a motion. We'll have two motions. One will be to admit the slate. I'll explain this when we get to it in more detail, but there will be a motion to admit the slate into consideration for the board election and then a motion to adjourn the formal portion of this meeting. Um, so to make a motion, you just raise a hand, your little raise hand function um, in the Zoom window. We'll take the motion, and then we'll also need someone to second the motion. So you can also raise your hand if you're a Crossref member to second a motion, um, and that will count as our board vote, or as our governance votes. Um, so to start us off, uh, if you were on, again, if you were on the morning session, you heard some of this um, overview from Ginny and Ed, but I will give a, a recap. Um, the focus of all of our work at Crossref over the last, I think now two years, um, have been these four strategic themes. Um, we try to, if, uh, the link isn't up here, but if you go to our website and to the strategic strategy session section of the website, you can see more detail, um, what specific projects fall under each of these themes, but there are four big themes of our area of focus for, um, these few years. The first one is contribute to an environment where the community identifies and co-creates solutions for broad benefit. Um, the second one is a, as a sustainable source of complete open and global scholarly metadata and relationships. If you were uh, here for much of Patricia's talk and, and um, some of the earlier sessions, a lot of that work falls into that kind of open um, and complete source of metadata. The third is manage Crossref openly and sustainably, modernizing and making transparent all operations so we are accountable to the communities that govern us. Um, that's part of what we're doing today. We're going to do our election, which uh, we'll talk through how that is an open process. We had a session earlier today um, around open infrastructure, the opportunities and challenges that go along with that. Um, what are the ways that, you know, kind of philosophical and also practical challenges that we face with open infrastructure? Um, I could talk all day about that, but I won't. Um, and how, how that kind of translates not just into infrastructure, but the organizations that run them and how those organizations are governed. So um, we talk a lot about that. Uh, and then fourth, is foster a strong team because reliable infrastructure needs committed people who contribute to it and realize the vision and thrive while doing it. So these are the four kind of strategic themes. They help us filter out what we're going to work on and what we are not able to prioritize. Um, and if you are, I think someone put it in the chat. Yes, thank you, Lisa. 
uh, on that page of the website, you'll see within each of those themes, there are specific projects that are, you know, in focus, that are up next, that have been recently completed, and that are kind of in a consideration period. We keep that page up to date. Um, it's kind of a broad organizational roadmap. It's it's certainly not just the technical work. It's a lot of the work that the outreach team does, the operations team does um, to support the advancement of each of these themes. Uh, so you can follow along there um, and it will often link out to blog posts and relevant pages of the website. And if there's something specific that you wanna know more about, um, it'll get you to the right person to, to follow up. <clears throat> So 2024 highlights so far, um, I won't read through all of these, but a few just to call out. Um, 2024 has been a busy year. Uh, we have been, if you were just on the previous session, we gave you an overview of the resourcing crosser for future sustainability project. That is, that project started, I think that project is like in year one and a half. Um, and we're there are five projects within it. It's the first round of projects we're trying to kind of reach resolution on. There will be more subsequent projects. That is an ongoing effort um, that takes uh, is really requires a lot of input from a lot of the community, um, the board, the committee, staff. So, that work is actively ongoing. Um, the grant linking system reached its five-year birthday uh, and we're continuing to see growth in, um, in, our, uh, in the system and, and in the uh, registered grants that we have metadata for. Um, we've been focused on as with, I'll show you membership growth in a minute, but with all things, you know, as we continue to grow, um, we're a staff of about, you know, in the mid forties is our total headcount. Um, we've, but we have over 20,000 members, so we have to manage scale on an ongoing basis. That is a constant conversation. Um, and the membership team has been focused on automating a lot of some of these processes that have, um, we have a very committed, very busy group of membership finance and support staff who keep Crossref running and um, an effort to alleviate them so that they can do more proactive work. We're trying to automate some of our more routine practices. Um, ROARs and affiliations have been incorporated into participation reports, which is um, very exciting. Uh, Luis earlier showed off the API Learning Hub. Um, which is a useful resource for anyone who is looking to retrieve metadata. Um, we have in the last, in the kind of second half of this year, the big focus has been on migrating to an open source database. So we were previously in an Oracle database. Um, the infrastructure and development and product teams have spent a great deal of time focusing on migrating to a Postgres database. We had that um, window in September where the system was down for a period of time while we completed that migration. So we are now running in a Postgres database. Um, we'd been in an Oracle database for 24 years. So that uh, was a big migration. The second phase of it, it's still, it is still physically in a data center in um, Linfield uh, and so that in Massachusetts, the second phase of it is moving it off of the machines into um, AWS. Uh, they kind of move it in pieces. So um, we'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, schema development, there's also more to come on that and there've been a load of REST API bug fixes, particularly in the last couple of months. Looking towards it's October 29th, we have about six working weeks left of the year. Um, 
and we still have a lot we want to do. So the team is busy. We are, like I said, focused on moving out of the physical data center fully into AWS. Um, the first piece of that was getting out of the database. That was kind of the big migration. And then that second piece is just moving off hardware into um, cloud-based servers, which is what is being worked on right now. Um, the Patricia gave an update on the schema work that is underway um, with reference types and a bunch of other things. There's, if you're curious about exactly what's in that, there's more detail uh, on, on the website. And the team's focused on those things as well as, you know, some additional bug work through the end of the year. Um, and then looking into next year, which is right around the corner. Um, the RCFS project, which is the resourcing project, uh, fee review, that it will still be underway in earnest into next year. We hope that the committee will soon be making some recommendations um, following some community consultation. So we will keep you up to date on that. There is also a web page on our website that we try to keep as up to date as we can on that project. Um, Preprint and other matching work uh, is a priority for the early part of next year. Um, we would, about this time last year, we had acquired the Retraction Watch database. It has been available openly since we did that, um, but it has not been incorporated fully into the REST API. So the next phase of that work will be to incorporate that into the REST API, so it's all kind of streamlined. Um, Luis mentioned that there's an API hack workshop coming up in Spain in 2025. Um, we've got more schema updates. Martin Rittman has been working on a revised cro uh, crossmark approach. Talked about that at the Frankfurt Book Fair and other community consultations. So that is planned for 2025. Um, and lots of integrity of, of the scholarly record, uh, committee work, engagement, um, and more to come on that. Thank you, Amanda, for your blog posts. There's lots, lots to keep track of on the blog. Um, so in looking at kind of where we are, um, organizationally, Crossref has seen steady growth of membership. This chart that Ginny prepared and shared earlier this morning dates back to the start of Crossref um, all the way through uh, where we stand as of this point in the year. Um, we see pretty steady growth in new membership uh, each year, which also speaks to kind of ongoing needs for support and the membership team and the finance team. And um, we have managed to uh, generally keep up with the scale of membership growth, but there we definitely reach kind of pain points, which is why some of the automation work and um, some of the other projects we've kind of identified for self-service, those are important to be able to for members to get what they need as quickly as they can. Um, Ginny made the right point here, which is that this uh, drop is the result of the uh, war in Ukraine and the impact on uh, our ability to work with members in Russia. We are still working with members in Russia. It just requires a great deal of diligence to review their applications and ensure they are eligible to work with us. Um, and then the membership team has concurrently been looking at kind of account consolidation and making sure as members come in that they are not another part of their organization isn't already a member. And so maybe they can just join onto the membership and um, that, that there's a lot of that work that goes on every day. But um, we, have still seen uh, kind of a healthy ongoing growth in, in membership. Primarily that comes through as sponsored members, 
but not exclusively. Um, and we'll look in a minute at um, subsequent revenue growth as it relates to membership. Country trends, uh, where are we seeing growth? This is excluding kind of the, the countries where we see typical growth, which is um, Brazil, Indonesia, Turkey, um, what are the other ones? India, UK, and US. So these are kind of um, the mem the countries that are are um, we're seeing newer growth and kind of more exponential growth um, that are less different than what we have you know typically seen in years past. Um, so the state of affairs is generally very healthy. Uh, these are our, this is our five year financials. I'm looking at how many years we have here. So it's 2019. Um, our financials are all available on our website. We publish our 990s and our audited statements. We have to go through a third party audit each year as a UO, US 501c6. We get audited um, to maintain our tax exemption. Those are all available online. Um, and this kind of shows you the comparison year over year. Um, these are, this is actual financial performance 2019 to 2023. And in the 2024 figures, we're looking at, this is actuals through September plus three months of forecast, what we see as trend. Um, where we expect to end the year uh, on various lines. And there are some pretty, we so we have, you know, 20, nearly 25 years of financial data at this point. And there are kind of some consistent trends that you see over time. Um, COVID was definitely a new factor uh, in our financial trends, but um, for the most part, there's some fairly consistent things you can keep an eye out for. Uh, membership fees, revenue for membership is up slightly this year. We had seen kind of some drops in recent years, uh, not drops, but like lower growth, you know, maybe only a point or two, um, which seemed understandable because a lot of our membership is sponsored and there is kind of ongoing console consolidation. There are you know, geopolitical reasons that our membership constricts. There's a number of factors involved, um, but it is up slightly this year. That's usually a leading indicator that content registration is also gonna be up. Um, they're not directly related. Content registration tends to lag behind the publication cycle by, you know, uh, we say on average six months, but, you know, with the changing membership profile, we don't, we can't say exactly. Um, but the breadth of Crossref's membership across 20,000 members um, supports the growth of content registration. So even if a typical member might register 10 items a year, um, that across 20,000 members, as membership grows, you kind of have that widening base of, of um, revenue. Um, Subscriber fees, again, kind of is, is in the inverse. It's a small base of subscribers that subscribe to our metadata. Um, so when you see consolidation in those accounts, which is what is happening here, uh, when companies consolidate, they might have each had a subscription, they're consolidating their subscription. You see that, you see that, um, that loss in subscribers. So that's kind of the difference in our, in our revenue base is membership is is quite broad subscribers is actually quite narrow so they they react differently to um to the same actions um content registration tends to i, I people are who work with me are probably sick of hearing me say this but it tends to do this like zigzag where if you have two high years you have one low year 
And then you have two high years and you have one low year. This is consistent with that. This is kind of the second high year. We had a low year in here somewhere. It was like around 2% increase. Um, and if you look at the past probably 12, 13 years, you see that pattern consistently. So we are in our second of a high year. Um, seems to pick up halfway through the year. So what the second half of the year looks like kind of interprets or is informative of what the next year is going to look like. Um, we have this line here, content registration fees donated is the GEM program primarily where we, um, those fees are waived. We also had a temporary fee waiver in, in Ukraine. Um, similarity check is our, the service that is for plagiarism detection that has grown this year. It has grown through two ways, new adoption of the service and existing users are checking documents more frequently. Um, so it's kind of a double effect on growth. On the person, on the expense side of things, personnel is our primary cost. Um, we have, uh, we have grown, their expenses have grown year over year for sure, but they are still under budget um, for where we expect it to be at this point in the year. Um, we have also seen growth in non-personnel expenses. This is primarily the increased cost of our AWS fees, um, which are will continue to grow. Uh, but probably not grow at the rate that they have been growing because we have been doing this migration. So once the system is fully in, which is what we have expected or what we have budgeted for 2025, we will expect increasing storage traffic usage will result in increasing AWS costs. But what we've been experiencing for the last couple of years have been these stair-step increases as we move big chunks of the system into AWS. Um, but that's a very real cost. It's much more expensive than running the system out of the data center, probably five times as expensive. Um, but it is necessary for the stability of the system and its persistence um, and our ability to maintain it. Um, at the standard that we would expect and that you would expect. So it's a necessary cost. Um, overall, the organization is doing very well um, in terms of health. Um, and we are planning for the 2025 budget, which the board will look at in two weeks time. Um, and we are looking at continued revenue growth. Um, we do have some planned expense uh, growth as well. And we, as, well, as soon as we'll, um, the board will prove that in, in November and then our budget cycle starts in January. Um, any questions on kind of the state of things? Okay. Lucy, there is one uh, question in the Q and A. Mm, what's the effect of the planned server migration on expenses? Yeah, good question. So we have budgeted for the increased usage uh, costs in AWS. Um, our AWS. Our monthly AW, expected AWS expenses for next year are a little over 100000 a month. So it's a big expense. Um, as a point of reference, we used to spend $250,000 a year on the data center. So we're looking at four to five times that cost for AWS. Um, the actual cost to do the migration is the cost of staff time. So that is built into the existing team. 
the ongoing costs, um, it's manageable, uh, but it is definitely um, a major expense that uh, we will have in perpetuity. So, um, and then there are additionally some efficiencies that the infrastructure team has in mind once they move the system over uh, that should make things run smoother and and more efficiently, but also may result in some cost savings. Um, but it is not an inexpensive endeavor, uh, but we are comfortable we can manage it within the existing cost base. You know, we used to spend, uh, you know, other things have changed since pre-COVID. We used to spend double what we were spending on travel. Um, we had two offices. We had, there was just a lot more. Uh, there were other kind of variable costs and fixed costs that we had that have, we've changed our business practices. Um, we're not traveling as much. We're not traveling as far. Uh, or we have folks that, you know, we kind of have divvied up the world and people can travel, you know, in ways that are more proximate to where they are based. That's helped us save on, on, uh, non-personnel costs. Um, we closed down our UK office. We still have our U S office. We are in the process of trying to get out of our lease, but, um, so we're able to kind of shift some of our non-personnel expenses around to, to make room. Uh, Lucy, there is a question in chat from James Walker. Uh, does the AWS account utilize reserved instances yet, uh, which have significant discounts? Thoughts there? Don't know the answer to that. I have heard talk of that, but I'm not sure, as, as you point out, if that is in place at the moment or if that is part of the planned kind of some of the re-architecting they want to know, want to do, but um, so I don't know exactly the answer. I can find out though. As soon as you need to relaunch your update your browser, you are correct. And I, you know, the number of tabs that you are not seeing open is, you know, a true blessing. Um, okay. Any other budget membership? Work questions. Okay. I think you're good. Good. All right. Let's do um, the board election portion. Um, I will give an overview of governance. We'll talk through our board recruitment and nomination process. Um, we'll go through election results, which the election closed at 1500 UTC. So we've had a quick preview of them. Um, but to give you an overview, I mentioned Crossref is a 501c6 organization, which is a US-based trade association. Um, we operate globally. We have staff in 11 countries, I think, at this point, but we are uh, registered as a U.S. company. Um, Crossref is governed by a board of directors. To be eligible for the board, every director um, is an employee or an officer of a member organization. Um, there And there is also specific parameters around what constitutes a member. Um, there are plenty of active parts of our community that are not technically eligible to be part of the board, um, sponsoring organizations, service providers, folks that we rely on um, are not technically members, so they are not eligible for board seats. The board is designated as members only. Um, and the board seat uh, belongs to the member organization. So each of our board members is an active participant um, representing Crossref and um, the community, but 
it's actually the board seat belongs to the organization. So that provides some continuity. If an individual leaves, the organization remains on the board and they could name someone else to the seat. Board members serve three-year terms. You're eligible for re-election. There are no term limits to your actual um, to your time on the board. There are term limits to certain officer roles and committee roles. Um, and we do have board members uh, sign whistleblower policies, conflict of interest disclosures each year to ensure that they are working in Crossref's best interest and on behalf of the membership um, to the best of their ability. So the role of the board is to provide strategic and financial oversight of the organization, as well as guidance to the executive director and the staff leadership team. Um, those key responsibilities include setting the strategic direction, providing financial oversight, um, approving new policies and services. This work happens um, in a number of ways, primarily at board meetings, which happen four times a year now, three kind of substantial meetings and one meeting just to kick off the year and do board leadership elections and kind of conduct board business at the top of the year. Um, Board members are also active on committees. Uh, the committees are set by the board in most cases. Working groups aren't necessarily, but committees are set by the board. Um, and the board will often set the committee's remit. And there is usually some dialogue between the committees and the board. You know, in some cases, specifically, the committee is charged to act on behalf of the board, in which, such as the case of the nominating committee, where there is kind of a little bit of a designed separation between the full board and the committee. Um, in other cases, the a committee may be a hybrid of board members and non-board members, such as the membership and fees committee, where the idea is, you know, you're getting a broader cross-section and that is providing um, insights and kind of a broader perspective into the board discussions. So a lot of work happens in committees. Um, and then the board does a number of things kind of one-to-one -one, supporting staff and helping make introductions and um, and facilitate discussions within their organizations around uh, Crossref aligned goals. Um, so we get to our audience participation now because we're going to move into our formal annual meeting. Uh, annual meeting Notice of the meeting was sent September 25th, 2024 to all of the voting contacts of record as of September 11th, 2024. Um, the board election is conducted primarily online. Uh, we work with a third party ballot company to do the election. Uh, we have the election culminates, though, at this annual meeting. So this is kind of the closeout. Um, we're going to have two calls for motions during this portion of the meeting. Anyone uh, who is a Crossref member can make a call for a motion. We'll ask you to raise your hand. Rosa or I will unmute you. You can make a motion. We'll also ask for a second. Similarly, you can raise your hand. We'll unmute you. Or you can unmute yourself and make a motion. Um, as of the sending of the notice, there were 20,224 members eligible to vote in the election. Our quorum, which is our minimum number in order to convene this meeting, is 100 members. We have 1,145 members represented by proxy, meaning they submitted their ballot online. Um, as well as those who are here today on the meeting. Uh, so we've met our minimum requirement for quorum. Um, I'm gonna pass it to Emily, who's gonna talk a little bit about um, more of the governance structure. Thanks, Lucy. Hi, everyone. 
As Lucy said, I'm Emily Cook, Crossroads Outside Council. <clears throat> Crossroads Board, as most of you may know, is comprised of 16 members. Each board member, as Lucy mentioned, is an employee of a Crossref member organization and serves, as you heard, a three-year term. Each year, about a third of the board seats are up for election. This year, there are four board seats to be filled. Per Crossref's bylaws, the board is structured to maintain a rough balance between member tiers based on revenue size. The nominees for the board each year are chosen by Crossref's nominating committee, uh, which is a group of representatives from five Crossref members, three of whom currently serve on the board and two who do not, and that's by design. And none of the members of the nominating committee can come from an organization that has a candidate on that current slate. As Lucy mentioned, the purpose of the NOMCOM is to review and create the slate each year for nominations to the board, ensuring as fair and broad representation of the membership as they can. This year's NOMCOM is on the screen in front of you, and we thank each of them for their service. Lucy, back to you, I think. Um, so this was this year's board slate. Uh, we had four seats open, two small seats in tier one, two large seats in tier two. I'm happy to read them out if you'd like. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, sure. In the smaller organization tier, for two available seats, as you see, Katarina Reek of the Austrian Science Fund, Lisa Schiff of the California Digital Library, Ajaz Khan of the Health Services Academy, Academy Pakistan Journal of Public Health, and Karthikayan Ramalingam of M &M, MM excuse me, Publishers. In the larger organization tier for two available seats, Aaron Wood, American Psychological Association, Dan Shanahan, the LOS, Amanda Ward of Taylor and Francis. Would someone make a motion to formally place these names in nomination? And as Lucy mentioned, we just need a representative of Crossref member. Just raise your hand. And Rosa will unmute you. Just need Lindsay McCallum. Thank you, Lindsay. So all you have to all you have to do, Lindsay, is unmute and just say I make a motion to um, place these names in nomination. Sure, I make the motion to place these names in nomination. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have a second? We just need someone to raise their hand or unmute. Ashley, thank you. Hi, second. Great. The motion. Ashley. We're now able to share the results. Um, as Lucy previously mentioned, the voting, as most of you know, is handled um, by a, a platform, third party platform run by eBallot. And so Lucy can announce the results of the vote. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to welcome and welcome back. Um, four candidates to the board, um, Katarina Reek of Austrian Science Fund and Lisa Schiff of California Digital Library will um, fill two of our tier one seats. Um, Aaron Wood of American Psychological Association and Amanda Ward of Taylor and Francis will fill two of our tier two seats. So thanks for the, can the slate that went forward this year was exceptional and um, we were really grateful for the committee's work on it. Um, and we're excited to have uh, two returning board members and two new board members joining us uh, in the 2025 board class. So that board will sit January 1st of 2025. Um, so welcome to them. And thank you to all those that voted. 
um, it's such an important part of Crossref that our membership governs our board uh, and has input into that. And so we really appreciate those that take time to read the statements and review the candidates um, and submit their ballots. It's really important to us. So thank you and welcome to the incoming folks. Thank you to all the candidates. Um, I will make one other plug before we move on to any other business. If you are interested, I'll only just go back to this uh, committee for a second. If you are interested in doing this committee, we always need non-board members. We have two non-board member seats every year and they are always the hardest to fill. So if you are interested in joining this committee in a future year um, and you wanna see the process by which we um, review board interest, uh, it is, I, I am biased, but I think it's a great committee and it's always really interesting to see the range of members and how um, folks bring such different perspectives and how they want to inform the work of the board. And it's just a fantastic uh, way to get involved. Um, email me and I will put my email in the chat um, just as we think of uh, planning for future committees. Um, let me know if you are ever interested. <clears throat> um, I will take any chance to do a shameless plug for the nominating committee. Um, all right. So unless we have other membership business before we wrap up, um, we do have 15 minutes. So uh, if there are questions or anything folks want to cover, questions about board process, anything we covered earlier, um, or any other business folks want to raise, uh, just raise your hand or put a question in the chat. Okay. Um, we get to do another motion. So I will need. Looks like you have um, one question. We, so, oh, great. Let's see. How often does the nominating committee meet? Very good question. The nominating committee meets, uh, depends on how many applications we get, but the call for interest goes out in usually around April, May, the open call for board interest. Um, we have about really four to six weeks of applications from um, interested members. And then the committee meets over a number of, of sessions, primarily between like May and September, um, probably about once a month depending on people's schedules. Um, there is some work we can do asynchronously, uh, but generally I think we probably met five or six times. Um, and, but it's short-term, you know, it's a, it's a con, con, concrete period of time. And then you kind of wrap up um, with, the finalization of the slate. So it's kind of a short-term commitment. Um, and last year we got about 50 applications. Some years we've gotten as many as 80. Those years, that is overwhelming because um, it is a lot to go through, but we have a system. The committee kind of is down to a well-oiled system for how we go through them. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a very, it's a nice group of folks every year. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna adjourn the formal portion of the meeting, which is again, kind of like the process we handle as part of this annual meeting as a subset of the broader annual meeting. Um, 
we will need a motion to adjourn the formal portion of the business meeting um, in a second. So does anyone want to raise their hand to have a motion to adjourn the formal portion of the meeting? We have to stay here until we do. Uh, okay, Patricia, if you would unmute and make a motion, please. Uh, I move to uh, close the formal portion of the meeting. Thank you. Uh, do I have a second? Mike. I second. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so we still have another session following us on spotlighting community initiatives. Um, and I, I suggest we wait until the top of the hour to begin that just in case anybody is planning to join when that so another little 12 minute break. Um, I will give you a, a heads up about what that's going to be. We are going to hear updates from the community. Uh, and we have three great presenters who are going to tell you about their work. We're going to hear from Alicia Wise, uh, Executive Director at Clocks. We're going to hear from Ariana Becerril Garcia, who is Executive Director at Reralic and co-founder of Amalica, about some work in Latin America. And we're going to hear from Mark Williams, Product Manager at Society and eLife. Um, so I say we take a, a short 12-minute break, um, re-adjourn at the top of the hour, and then here are those terrific presentations. Sound good? Great. And okay. you need not you need not uh, make a movement or a second. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just mandate that we do that. <laughs> All right. See you in a bit. Thanks, everyone. Hello, are we all? We are one minute past the hour, but I do see a number of people joining. So we will take, I think, just one more minute before we begin with our community presenters talking about their work. And thanks for all of those, those of you who have stayed with us. Um, as a reminder, um, Please do feel free to post questions in the Q&A for preference. We will be also monitoring the chat. It's a bit easier for us to see questions if they're posted in the Q&A. Uh, all the slides and recordings will be shared afterward and so that you can catch up on anything that you might have missed. And we're always happy to follow up with you. Um, I have two minutes past the hour, um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. The next segment of our annual meeting involves updates from uh, the Crossref community. We're going to hear from three presenters, uh, beginning with Alicia Wise, who is the Executive Director of Clocks, um, to speak about um, preserving scholarship for future generations. After that, we'll hear from Mark Williams uh, of Society of Society eLife. And then Ariana Becerril Garcia from America and Red Alic. Um, Alicia, I will turn it over to you. I will be running the slides, so just let me know when you'd like me to advance them. Awesome, Amanda. Thank you very much. And hello, everybody. Nice to be um, with the Crossref community today uh, to talk about preserving scholarship for future generations. So I'm going to be talking about long term digital preservation. And let me tell you what that is not first, and then we'll dive into what it is. So this is very different than making a backup copy of your content and putting it someplace safe or making two or three backups. Long-term preservation is about um, depositing um, versions of your content in an archive where it will be carefully um, and attentively maintained over time. So not even a single bit or byte will change. And this is really important because the future of access to the scholarly record depends on long-term digital preservation. Think about um, risks to content, uh, tsunamis, earthquakes, hacking, ransomware attacks, simple human error. 
um, things can happen to our content. So publishers are very attentively and assiduously looking after the access copies and making them available. And an important complementary role that publishers play is ensuring that the content is published or deposited rather in an archive. The archivists look after the bits and bytes then, we don't make the content accessible. That's not our job. It's to think about 500 years in the future and how it remains available uh, for future scholars and members of the public. So the kind of shocking thing, um, digital preservation services have been um, active. Um, for example, Portico and Clocks, we both uh, began life in the late 1990s. But still, the long-term preservation of journals and books is not a done deal. There's much more that needs to be done. Martin Eve, for example, has published a, a study using a large selection of metadata in Crossref, which suggests that over 25% of journals are at risk because they are not um, preserved in long-term archives. And nobody can calculate the equivalent figure for books at the moment. There isn't uh, a similar sort of data, data set or, or metadata record that anyone can draw on to do the calculation. So standards, metadata identifiers play a powerful enabling role. And that's what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today. Next slide, please, Amanda. So uh, and slide after that, too, that would be great. Thank you. So I'm going to be presenting um, the work of this fantastic group of librarians and publishers who've come together over the last 18 months to do three things. Next slide, please. The first of those things is that they have collaborated to create a guide for publishers on preserving books in particular. And it lays out, this is a fantastic readable guide, it lays out why this is a good thing to do for your library customers who want to be confident that the content that they are funding and investing in will remain accessible. It's a powerful way to please your authors who want to know their scholarship is part of the long-term scholarly record, and it should be part of every publisher's um, disaster recovery planning as well. And this guide, it's friendly, easy to read. It'll talk you through the steps, how to decide what to preserve and, and how to find a trusted partner to help you. The second thing that great working group did is on the next slide. Thank you, Amanda. Um, we looked around and there is a gap at the minute in how to preserve eBooks that are formatted in the EPUB format. And so working uh, through ISO, and in close partnership with the W3C, um, we have brought together experts to look out how to evolve the EPUB standard and to add to it um, an archival format. So this will be a, a subset of the EPUB standard, um, and it will enable you to make sure that the content that you send to an archive is in its most preservable form. Um, this is currently going through uh, the ISO process. It's in draft form at the moment, and we expect the formal uh, standard to be um, popping out the other side in about 18 months' time. Um, so watch this space. There is a draft. If anybody would like it, just drop me an email. Happy to share that with you. The third thing the working group did on the next slide is to start thinking about how we get our heads around what books are preserved where. And this came into focus as a great piece of work by Michael Laxo. The URL for it isn't displaying on my slide for some reason, but I will pop that into the chat after I stop yakking at you. Um, what he found, this was looking at OA books in particular, was this extraordinary breadth of platforms where books are published and hosted. And this sort of was an alarm, um, uh, alarm uh, call that we really do need to get our minds around how to figure out which of these books are preserved where. Anyway, the long and the short of it is that the working group has decided that it would start with a proof of concept project, which is on my last slide. Thanks, Amanda. And the, there we go. Um, the proof of concept project works like this in a nutshell. Publishers, we're asking you to include in um, code 47 and 48 of your Onyx metadata feeds, information about where you're depositing your books. Archives like Clocks and Portico or National Library 
we can um, surface what is in our holdings through KBART files and also through um, other metadata feeds. And the proof of concept is about how we channel those into discovery services to make them discoverable by libraries and others. And through this sort of collective action, we can finally begin to answer that mysterious question, how many academic books, how many other books are preserved for the long term as part of our cultural and intellectual heritage. So looking forward to working with you all on this. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you so much, Alicia. Um, uh, we can take questions, I think, after each presentation. And I do actually have a question. I don't know if you know the answer to it, but um, I'm sorry, you, you just now you mentioned how many scholarly books versus how many other books. And I'm just sort of curious, is that even a thing that we can determine? Uh, no, not I can, <laughs> because the definitions seem to uh, blend in. Okay. So we might not all agree on what an academic book is, but even if we could agree on definitions, there isn't um, a single universal source of truth. In journals, the ISSN agency, for example, has a record of every single ISSN anywhere in the world. But in the books, it's all fragmented across different national registration agencies. And there is no organization, as far as I know anyway, tell me if I'm wrong, that can tell you even uh, which books are minted. They might have given out ISBNs for books that haven't um, been assigned by publishers yet. So it's just much more hmm, uh, fun and challenging and maybe <laughs> murky. Yeah, I could imagine, um, you know, and then, of course, in journals, too, there's the peer reviewed distinction versus something not peer reviewed. And we don't really have that for books, especially because, you know, you 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 could try to do it by publisher, say, if something is a university press, but that wouldn't work because lots of university presses publish things that are fundamentally trade publications. And like even that. trade publications, I would say, um, really should be archived. I would say this as an, as an archivist, but um, trade books are used in English departments, in um, regional studies. They are used for scholarship. So actually, it's really important that that part of our cultural heritage also becomes part of the long-term record and is looked after and protected as well. Um, I do also have um, another question, and we do have quite a bit of time for this, so I hope uh, folks will be patient for, with me, and um, if there are other questions, please please let me know because I can't always look at the Q and A or the chat while I'm screen sharing. Uh, but I suppose the other question I have is, um, do you at Clocks make any kind of, or does this project make any kind of distinction between digital first content or um, versus digitized content? Um, I, and I suppose too, I'm thinking of with books in particular, at least my mental model tends to think of books as being print first with then perhaps an ebook copy as a, as a side note, but I, it depends on the book, I guess. These are great questions. We should, you know, we should go have coffee and we could talk <laughs> all this stuff for a long time. So um, from a clock's perspective, we're comfortable preserving born digital books or digitized um, um, backlist titles, it, it, it doesn't matter. Anything that's in digital format can be preserved. But the advice and guidance we would give about what formats you might want to, to use, um, the work that might need to be done around metadata for very older titles, all of that would vary. Um, but you know, anything that is in, in bits and bytes, it can be looked after and can be preserved at digital in, in a digital format in some way, shape, or form. Well, I will cease asking questions now. I did see a question in the chat about how to obtain an ISBN for an academic book publication. I think that's probably out of your purview and certainly out of mine, but um, uh, perhaps somebody else can can answer that. Um, I it, it's I don't know to be honest. You you as you know, it's it's a thing that publishers do for you when you publish a book. They make sure that there is an ISBN somehow or another. Unique identifiers, ISBNs, DOIs, ISSNs, all, you know, absolutely invaluable and actually increasingly as well, identifiers for the authors, their employers, their funding agencies. That is a fancy way of avoiding answering the question because I've never actually 
Oh, actually, I think I did mention ISBN once, but it was through the British Library. So that'll be different in every yeah. country. Yeah. I don't know the answer. So Samuel, I'm sorry. I don't. I think this is a bit out of our about out, out of our expertise. Somebody may know, but um, we can certainly look into that for you. Uh, I mean, right. Before you yes. uh, go on, there is one question in the Q and A. Do you want to check? Oh, that there one? is. Yes. Sorry. Um, and that question is uh, uh, actually two questions. I see. Um, thanks, Rosa. And now three. Um, Natasha asks, what about preservation of gray literature, such as theses? In Europe, many universities keep them in repositories, but is it also material that clocks would consider? Clocks doesn't currently uh, preserve electronic theses and dissertations. And it's not because um, we couldn't from a technical perspective. It's a collecting priority. Um, our board has decided that we will focus on formally published literature. Um, uh, overlay journals included um, and, and that sort of thing. But we have this great sister service um, called the Global Locks Network, and that does facilitate the preservation of electronic theses and dissertations. And as you said, many institutional repositories do too. And some of those have preservation services built in or alongside them. Um, uh, yes, absolutely. I'm going to stop there. Um, we have another question from Lisa Schiff. Uh, what do you recommend for preservation for non-traditional monograph-like publications, such as digital humanities publications? Ooh, now I love this question. So um, there are uh, very uh, advanced interactive uh, forms of eBooks that are being published now. We're part of a Mellon-funded project at the minute to look at preservation strategies for that kind of material. Um, and I'm going to pop into the chat some you some URLs where you can get a little bit more information about that. That is sort of the painful bleeding edge of digital preservation work, but it's also very exciting. And there are a lot of new developments in that space. Wonderful. And then uh, we also have a question from Rhiannon Miller, who asks, does the fact that the material is not made available help avoid copyright issues like what happened to the Internet Archive? Um, so clocks works by agreement with publishers um, and um, we have contracts with them. We're a dark archive. So that means by design, we're looking after the preservation copies and we leave the publisher to think about how to provide access to the books or the, to the journals. We don't interfere with um, any kinds of access provision. Our job um, and the contracts we have enable us to bring content out of the archive and make it available to everyone open access if the publisher goes out of business and, and disappears and the content disappears with them. Um, or if they let us know that they will cease publishing, that their new successor interests or, or, or other rights holders, then we have the rights that we need to continue providing access in the long term. But, but our role in that space um, begins when the publisher um, 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 stops providing access, where their role ends. So they're complementary. Wonderful. Um, well, th thank you so much, uh, Alicia, for a very thought-provoking uh, presentation. I'm sure people would be happy to get in touch with you um, with further questions, and um, perhaps including me <laughs> later on. Um, so we're now going to move on um, to hear from Mark Williams um, with Society and eLife, I should say. Society is part of eLife. And uh, Mark is going to talk to us about building preprint histories, enhancing discoverability of and recognition for preprint peer evaluation. Um, so Mark, again, uh, as with Alicia, I am going to go ahead and manage the slides for you. Uh, and then we can have um, some questions and uh, uh, questions, uh, question and answer period afterward. Mark? Cool. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Amanda. And thanks, Alicia. I think uh, archiving and preservation leads nicely into talking about building preprint histories. So first slide. Thanks. Yeah, so that's what we're talking about. Building preprint histories with society and crossref. So we're going to talk about how we're using some of the crossref metadata today. So next slide, thanks. So society is a, a place to find and engage with the latest community peer evaluation evaluated science and we we call this stuff like um structured peer review commentary and curation of the research uh, next slide 
Our mission is to foster trust and transparency in early stage research by bringing together community driven peer evaluation initiatives and ensuring that their contributions are recognised as essential scholarly communication. On top of that, we want to provide researchers with meaningful insights into preprints while building a connected and open ecosystem for research evaluation. So quite, quite uh, a, a big mission. And so how do we do this? Uh, next slide, please. So we're partnering with organisations and communities across the globe that provide highlights, public reviews and recommendations of preprint research, helping researchers assess the quality and the relevance of early stage research. And here are some of the organisations that form groups on society. Uh, next slide. And this is how we're building preprint histories with Crossref. So um, we establish partnerships. We then aggregate information from uh, wherever we find it. So there's lots of different platforms that we're trying to bring the data from, and we do that using a bunch of open and interoperable um, protocols, um, including our own APIs, but also things like DocMaps and CoreNotify uh, from a range of different systems. And then, excuse me, my dog. No, geez, my door, my doorbell's just gone. It's always the way for presentations. Try that again. Can you hear the dog in the background? Sam? I thought I could. I'll carry on. And so, so how do we enable the uh, recognition and reward of preprint peer evaluation? Well, that's by sharing it. And we do that through a number of other protocols. So places like Bioarca and places like Europe PMC and some sites on the website. So next slide, please. Sorry, yeah. Dogs is the correct around. one, or should I go back? <laughs> no, that's fine. So this is this is um, the the how we're using crossref metadata to pull in front matter. So on the left hand side, you see some of the search results on Society, and on the right hand side, there's an article page. Apart from the article page is the paper title and the formatting uh, for our front matter that we give to the uh, The authors and the ordering of those, and the abstract and the formatting. Uh, of the, the action. So, um, next slide, thanks. Uh, so, this is the relationship type. So, this is. Um, so, what we do here, oh, sorry, I'm really being interrupted by the dog at the moment. I might have to go and calm her down. <laughs> sorry. Emma? <laughs> well, we'll take a, a, a small break while we look at these, and I would actually be interested to look, to learn, uh, maybe just in the chat, um, who here has heard of new model services such as pre-review um, shown here. So yeah, mention that. All set? Yeah, apologies, folk. Uh, I think everything's calmed down a little. Um, so yeah, to enable recognition and reward for preprint review, we also recursively walk the crossref graph of related items. Uh, and that way we can surface preprints and anything that's published in, in journals, et cetera, to start building this history of the preprint. Uh, and having DOIs for each expression of the paper, that's our terminology for, for part of the bigger work, uh, enables us to build that bigger picture. So next slide. So working in this domain, it's not without challenges. These are some of the ones that my team uh, identified when we were putting together this talk. I don't expect people to read through all of them, but uh, some stuff like, you know, not having an identifier for a work as opposed to an expression is something that comes up for us. We're trying to create a body of work and identify multiple versions of preprints from wherever they're hosted and bring them into one place. Uh, some publishers don't uh, issue neat IDs for the expressions, um, so we we have to make extra API calls to try and find that stuff. 
even the word preprint is a term that's interpreted differently uh, across the ecosystem. Um, in some cases, things that are, are or were preprints are con then considered journal articles. So we're then trying to sort of uh, structure that uh, ourselves. And we'd like you know, more consistent use of the metadata that's deposited. But we have some nice surprises as well. Um, we thought initially that it would uh, be difficult to uh, build a database uh, of crossref information, but actually by querying the API, we found very acceptable performance and caching the responses. Um, similarly, uh, showing people the relationships on society pages between preprints and their journal articles actually, has actually encouraged uh, some of the uh, people within our ecosystem, some of our partners, to deposit crossref metadata, which is a great outcome um, for, for the work we're doing. So uh, next slide. And this sums it up. So really working uh, with society supported by its use of crossref metadata enables us to become a bigger part of, of scholarly infrastructure, enhances the discoverability and the transparency in the process of peer review and enables greater opportunities to recognize and reward peer evaluation preprints in the future. Uh, next slide. And that's it. So we're on connect at society.org if anyone would like to reach out and chat further about preprints, peer evaluation, and all of that stuff, because that's the kind of stuff we like talking about. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, very, very interesting. Um, I don't see any questions right now in the Q&A panel. I do see some some discussion in the chat about things like uh, pre-reviews approach and um, preprint servers, um, posters on this approach. So happy to hear from anybody who's currently discussing in the chat um, about anything that you're you're talking about. Um, feel free to unmute and uh, and let us know. Last call, comments, questions, suggestions? Hello. Yes, Ahmad. Uh, yes, um, can I ask some uh, another question which is not directly related to the presentations? Um, sure, if it's, if it's, sure, go ahead. Okay, so I'm from basically originally from Pakistan and uh, we do have um, Crossref uh, sponsorship for our journal. We are publishing a journal since 1960s. Uh, now we have received some information from Crossref that uh, our sponsorship is ending and we need to go to some sort of like payment system. I wonder that is there any other thing which is going on for the developing countries that they can continue receiving the service of Crossref without uh, charges because it's very expensive for our purposes. So I do think that that is very off topic from what we're talking about right now, uh, but I think that probably we do have um, support um, people here uh, from Crossref who are on the chat. I'm sure they'll be happy to, to take your information and address those questions with you um, later on. And I also don't know, Ahmad, if you might have been here earlier when we were talking about our um, ongoing project to look at uh, resourcing Crossref for future, future sustainability, which means re-examining our fees and so on. So yes, we do have, have lots of options for you and I'll, I'll be very sure to after this coming presentation to make sure that you're in touch with somebody who can talk about I, it. I really appreciate that. I'm sorry I wasn't there in the morning, so I just joined now. Sure. So like half an hour ago. So yeah, thank you very much. If you could okay, put great. me yep. in touch with somebody. Yeah. We'll put you in touch with somebody. All right, thank, thank you. you. Okay, so um, meanwhile, and we do have some uh, additional chat going on um, with posters being shared and so on in the chat. Um, but what I'd like to do now is hear from our third presenter, um, which is Ariana Garcia from Redalic and Amelica, uh, talking about Redalic on trends in OA publishing in Latin America. Ariana, I am going to give you slide control. So you should be, or I'm going to actually um, allow you to share your screen. Um, let's see here. Hang on. Yep. There you are. Thank you very much, Amanda. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can see my presentation now. Could you please confirm? Yes, it's all great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for this invitation. It's, I'm really happy to share for the very first time uh, with all the CrossRap community today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And in this case, I uh, like to talk about the, um, the general landscape. Where uh, are we in terms of diamond open access in Latin America? I think maybe you're familiar a little bit with the, with the ecosystem of, uh, in particular, journals, uh, which are diamond in Latin America. I think this is a, a very strong region in terms of non-profit publishing. And I would like to just um, give a general uh, landscape of uh, where we are, but also um, some challenges that, that we are facing in the region. Uh, well, oh, so. So, uh, well, the ecosystem in Latin America is mainly uh, sustained by the academic sector. Uh, well, higher uh, educational institutions and uh, research, uh, research, the research community in general is uh, kind of not only leading, but also controlling and sustaining publishing in the region. So uh, it is a more than a tradition in, in the, in, in the, in the academic institutions to publish journals with their own resources, and also to have, uh, well, to provide this uh, service um, without cost for uh, uh, readers and not also for authors. And uh, this is, uh, in this sense, uh, an ecosystem that has been sustained for decades. Now we have, well, hundreds of uh, Diamond Open Access journals in the region that are mainly sustained uh, with uh, public funds. So somehow uh, from a developing region uh, with uh, different restrictions and needs around uh, communicating the science that is generated in, in the region, we somehow um, need, need to be creative and, and to start this, this sector of non-profit publishing. And now we have a kind of this well, ecosystem that is composed by these hundreds of journals, uh, institutions as, um, as publishers, but also different, different infrastructures, open infrastructures, directories, platforms that are a, like an, an, an upper layer uh, to provide different services to this ecosystem in terms of visibility, in terms of journal production in terms of preservation, in terms of discoverability. So uh, these open infrastructures uh, really help this mass of journals that are being published in the region in order to support these, um, these functions without uh, charging journals. And this is particularly the case, for example, to in the case of DOIs, uh, that is something very challenging, as the as as one person said from Pakistan in, in, in five minutes ago. This is very challenging also for journals in Latin America. So, in this sense, uh, infrastructure uh, infrastructures like Redalic, for example, the one that I um, I'm running is is in charge of providing these added value services to the region in order to be a uh, well to, to to cooperate to the sustainability to the of the sector so uh we are not we're, uh, the, the thing is that now we are like taking these um efforts that are that, that are structural to the academic institutions but in order to secure their sustainability but also to increase the uh, the recognition yep. of the contribution of these journals we are kind of evolving from open access uh, journals to digital public goods. And what does it mean? Um, it means that the communities that are being benefited by a journal, for example, they need to be also responsible of, um, of contributing to the sustainability, for example, of a journal. So if we take science, we, this, this approach as the core of the model, then we need to think of science as a public good, and then the public good provides, by definition, a universal benefit. 
uh, but it also demands collective sustainability. And I think in this equation of these two factors uh, is the key for the long-term survival of journals in the, in the region. So we need to recognize this universal benefit, but also we need to um, make our communities responsible for the collective sustainability. So to achieve these two dimensions of public goods, which is the, the non-rivalry condition of science, which is by definition we, that we can achieve by, the, by, by definition uh, and journals that are, are now available in, in the web. They are by definition uh, non-rivalrous, non-excludable. So nobody uh, takes the right of other uh, people in, uh, when access to information in the web, when it's, when it's open access. So uh, we are working with various um, entities, various groups in Latin America in order to analyze this collective sustainability to, to, to secure this um, contribution from the community. So we are, I, I'm just going to present some of these uh, preliminary results uh, of publishing institutions as funders of journals. And also this, um, assessment of the universal benefits. So uh, journals, um, we want to make visible the contribution to countries or to other institutions. Uh, and we have, uh, found, uh, we, we have found out, for example, that uh, in terms of Diamond Open Access journals in Latin America, uh, the, and this is based on data from Redalic, we can see that the academic sector is uh, the main publisher that uh, of Diamond Open Access uh, journals in the region, but also governments, but also the health sector and a minority of, of the private sector. So it's very interesting to see also the breakdown by country where you can see the, the contribution of the academic sector. Uh, for example, in the case of, I don't know, Cuba, we, we can see the more diversified uh, uh, landscape of uh, publishers coming from different sectors. Universities, there's, there's a strong investment in Diamond Open Access Publishing uh, from the government, so sustaining quality journals from the region. And uh, it's important also to assess how Diamond Open Access Journals are providing service uh, uh, for the community worldwide. So sometimes when we tend to think that um, a, if a journal is published in Latin America, then it's serving the Latin American, the Latin American community, but uh, a journal by definition and a digital journal provide a service to an epistemic community or author's community. And thus uh, it, it doesn't mean that it is restricted by a geographical region necessarily. So you can see here, for example, that the journals that are indexed in Redalic, they are providing actually a, ser a service for authors worldwide. And it's very interesting to see, for example, this non-profit ecosystem that is being built in Latin America, sustained mainly with public funds in the academic sector. Then, for example, authors from Europe, authors from Africa, authors from Asia are publishing in in, in these journals. So they are really acting as digital public goods. And this is important to be recognized not, not only by uh, institutions in Latin America, but wo worldwide in order to endorse these journals, their prestige that sometimes we can, uh, we can see from commercial journals by default, but, but uh, these non-commercial journals does not necessarily have this recognition worldwide. This is, for example, the analysis by, by country where we can see how, for example, in, in, on the left, how Brazilian journals or Mexican journals or Colombian journals are providing service to other countries. So uh, the investment of one country is also is benefiting the, the same country, of course, but also other countries. So this is, this is exactly the concept of a public good. So if, uh, everybody invest in a piece of the ecosystem, then everybody can have this benefit. And this is how the investment of countries is benefiting on other countries. And this is, if we analyze um, this, the, the same aspect, by, but by institution, we can see, for example, the investment of the 
Sao Paulo University in Brazil, uh, the investment in their journals, how they are uh, providing a benefit to other institutions worldwide. I think it's very important if we see a journal as a public good, and then we can somehow make this contribution visible. So we are in this transition to, uh, to assess um, uh, Diamond Open Access journals as public goods. And we are uh, working with a framework of the Digital Public Goods Alliance that propose different criteria in order to um, uh, assess or to evaluate uh, based on these criteria a, a, a digital solution so to be considered as digital public goods. So we identify, for example, if they use open content, open data, open source software, uh, etc. Uh, particularly uh, in Red League, this is exactly our mission. So we have now, well, these are our numbers. We act as a, as an index uh, to, to assess the quality of, uh, of uh, scholarly journals. We have now 1,700 1, index journals in our system from 31 countries, and we also index the full text. So we act like a, a secondary a host of the full text of each article. And uh, our services are aimed to uh, add value and to secure quality, improve visibility, discoverability of these journals. So we provide different services and, and particularly the, the one that is most impactful is the technology for journal production. So uh, we provide this uh, markup system to help journals to generate automatically their different file formats. I mean, EPUB, HTML, PDF, and all the different output files uh, in order, well, based on XML uh, with uh, the standard JATS. So we can help in the sustainability of the journals by lowering their production costs. This is um, these are systems that we uh, provide for free uh, to the journals that we index in in Redalic. This is our uh, coverage right now uh, from well 2018. We committed to provide our services exclusively to Diamond Open Access journals because we really want to address the most vulnerable uh, uh, journals. So we only work with journals that are uh, not for profit journals and that are run by academic or governmental uh, organizations uh, coming uh, well from uh, any country of the world, not only from Latin America. And well, and these are different uh, dimensions we are working on in the region. Uh, if we want to to move or to evolve from open open access in particular and open science in general, we would like to advance uh, in based on this approach of science as a global public good. So we are working with an important alliance between green open access and diamond open access uh, with an agreement with La Referencia. Perhaps you have heard about La Referencia, which is the regional network of uh, institutional and national rep repositories in the region. Uh, we also work uh, with uh, different interoperability standards and also with the development of technology, which is uh, the key uh, that helps us to leverage uh, open, open access uh, in, in this non-commercial ecosystem. So, well, for us, this framework of open science, uh, this transition that is uh, somehow uh, formalized with the recommendations of UNESCO, is an opportunity to rectify some bi uh, biases, biases, and defects, uh, and also distortions and the invisibility that the science uh, that uh, have been published in Latin America faced um, during well many, many decades, and to achieve equity in the system, to achieve diversity, to achieve the inclusion as well. And we are committed well to preserve this ecosystem. And also, well, just a, a final slide to invite you all to the second global summit on diamond open access. Well, the first one was held uh, here in Mexico, in Toluca last year, and now it's going to be hosted by the University of Cape Town. So I think this is a very important forum to discuss how we can strengthen Diamond Open Access and 
how we can collaborate. And in this particular case, is um, for us a very good opportunity to, to, to help developing countries and to cooperate together in, in, this, in this case, Africa and also Latin America in order to uh, well share experiences, share technology, to really strengthen our uh, ecosystem of journals. So uh, the, the registration is still open. So it, it could be great if you can join us in this December in Cape Town. Well, I think I, I'm stopped here. I'm very happy to answer any questions you, you may have. Thank you so much, Ariana. It was really, really fascinating. Um, wonderful graphics. I think some of us are, are quite envious. <laughs> um, we do have uh, one question in the Q&A from Alicia Wise, who asks, uh, how many people work on the Redelic service? Uh, thank you, Alicia. Uh, we are now like 60 people working here in Redalic. <laughs> well, half of them are uh, students. We have a lot of young people here. And around half of them are software developers. Mm. So yeah, I think I, this is a great team. Um. And Alicia also asks, what would you say are the most important two or three challenges you're working on right now? Uh, well, I can mention like 10 or 12, <laughs> but, <laughs> but yes, uh, let's focus on two. Uh, I think sustainability is very important um, because, uh, well, we work for Diamond Open Access Journals and we are always looking at, the, at their needs so we can provide uh, services to help them. And we can see each day how we lose diamond journals in the region because they are being acquired by commercial services or they, they just um, die because of lack of resources to stop publishing. So it's very challenging in that sense, but I think it, it goes, um, uh, it is uh, a problem that is not only about money, it is about recognition as well in research system. So research assessment really needs to recognize the contribution of a journal by its quality, no, not by a brand, not by a particular indicators, but uh, for a, a more comprehensive view of a journal. And in this sense, I think uh, uh, the lack of resources many times Come, uh, comes from the under recognition of journals in the region. So the same happens with the infrastructure that, that are in the regions that are somehow uh, under recognized in the, uh, in, in the ecosystem internationally. So I think this is one of perhaps the most challenging uh, things that we have in the region. And just, uh, we do have another question from Mark uh, from Society eLife, but I have one additional question for you. Um, again, abusing my um, my capacity as facilitator to ask my own questions, but how do you think Crossref can best help support um, your efforts, the efforts of Renalik? We're very happy now that we are members of Crossref because we can, well, in this particular sense of VOIs, for example, we are, um, we are acting like a proxy or like a hub to 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 make some resources available to journals so we can for example uh, a, a, a acquiring or purchasing dois and then distribute directly to the journal this is our plan to directly to the journals that are not able to afford for them so in this sense, I think it is like a good alliance because we can help in terms of visibility and to make this content you know, available uh, worldwide. And I think this is very good for Diamond Journals here in the region. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, Mark, um, we do have an additional question for you uh, from Vincent Lizzie from Taylor and Francis in the in the Q&A. Have you found any useful guidelines or noticed any common patterns regarding when a new expression of a work is given a new identifier versus a new version number, keeping the same identifier? There are a lot of variations in practice. In short, no, I don't think. I probably defer to the, um, the developer team to 
uh, answer that a bit more fully. Um, but it's it feels like we are in the space of um, becoming kind of town town settlers. So it is a bit of a wild west, and people are doing things differently, and um, we're trying to think through that and and add a little more structure um, through it. So I don't think I can provide a more uh, succinct answer than that at the moment. <laughs> Any other questions for any of our wonderful presenters from the Crossref community? Oh, I have a question for Ariana, actually. Yes, sure, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if um, if you're aware of, of journals that are indexed by Redilac that uh, are reviewing preprints. I, I'm not aware of that, but I would love to to work uh, together in that sense because I think. And we have like a complement, these are complementary models. So preprints must work directly with a diamond uh, and also with green open access and well, love to collaborate in that sense, but I, I'm not aware. Thanks, Mark. Well, thank you. Great. Well, thank you all so much for presenting. We really, really appreciate um, hearing what you're up to and how Crossref fits into that. So um, um, applaud, all the applause for our three presenters. Um, we hope to see you uh, at future Crossref meetings and around and about in the scholarly communication ecosystem. Um, our next item on the agenda is just to hear some summary remarks from Ed Pence. And so I can turn it over to Ed as well, um, just to give um, some brief summary. We are a bit, we're a little ahead of time, uh, but I think we're just going to go ahead and uh, uh, hear Ed's remarks uh, and then move on to some interactive breakout groups. Ed? Background, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amanda. And thank you very much to uh, the speakers from the last session, from uh, Mark, Ariana, and Alicia. Uh, and um, it was really interesting, covered a lot of, uh, covered a lot of territory. And really, I don't, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm going to keep my remarks uh, very, very short. Uh, what we are going to be doing is um, having uh, some breakout sessions. We did some breakout sessions uh, earlier today. They worked very well, to giving people a chance to talk about some issues in it in some smaller groups. So I will uh, get get to that. So uh, we're not closing the the meeting just yet. But um, I did want to say that. Um, uh, the annual meeting is important in Crossroads governance. Uh, we had the session earlier where we had the election and the election results. And uh, I was looking back at this and Crossroads uh, first annual meeting was in uh, 2000, in November 2000. So, uh, almost, uh, so this is actually the 25th uh, annual meeting. And next next year is our, our 20th, 25th anniversary year. So. Uh, you may be hearing a little bit more about that uh, when we when we get into next year. So I thought that was important just to note that that uh, milestone. Um, and uh, you know, it se it seems like a long time in some ways, <laughs> but also in talking about what we're talking about today in terms of preservation and the scholarly record and wanting to preserve it for a long time, hundreds of years, uh, potentially uh, thousands of years. Who knows? Uh, you know. 25 years is, is is nothing. So I think with a lot of this stuff, we're we're still in the very very early stages of things. Um, so I did just want to say that um, following up from this, uh, just a reminder that we do have our community forum, and uh, there's uh, a lot of different uh, resources there. And part of that is to engage the community, and the community can help each other. But Crossref staff are involved in that so there are support type questions but i think particularly on the resourcing crossref project uh, we may start up some channels on there uh, to discuss some of the topics that uh, came up today so just uh, uh, have, have a look at that um, going forward i just also wanted to remind people that we have our ambassador program and uh, to, to thank our ambassadors we have around uh, 40 or so ambassadors in around uh, 40 countries and they help uh, with with local support uh, and uh, providing webinars and uh, even organizing some live events and you can see information about that on 
on our website. So a big, big thank you to our ambassadors. And if anybody's interested in being an ambassador, uh, please, uh, please get in touch. And um, also really just to say, I guess, to say thank you uh, for uh, a range of thank yous for uh, all the speakers uh, today. Uh, we've had uh, a lot of sessions starting at uh, 8 a.m. UTC uh, this morning. <clears throat> and uh, so really uh, there were panelists and moderators and, and all the staff who were involved. So a really big thank you for that, but particularly also uh, Cora and Rosa from, from Crossref did a lot of the heavy lifting from, uh, with logistics, uh, today. So thank you. Thank you very much, Rosa and Cora. And just to note that I think there, there are some people who've been on for all the sessions today. So well, well done if you've managed to, uh, stay through all that and only, only a little, a little, a little while longer to, uh, uh, to go on, on that front. Um, but yeah, just really to say thank thank you very much for everyone uh, for attending. But I think uh, I would encourage you to stay and not be able to move into the uh, to the smaller groups now that we have discussions because we got some really good uh, information out of them uh, earlier uh, earlier today. So I think that's all I was going to say for the moment, and I'll hand over. I think uh, who will organize? Um, I'll, if you take it from here. Um, Ed, do, you mind, do you mind advancing the slides just to sure. get to the breakouts? That'd be great. Um, so thank you very much. Okay, so just a real quick hello. I'm Rosa Clark, uh, and I'm on the engagement team, and I'm very happy to be with you all today. So as we're winding down uh, our meeting here, we're going to open up some breakout rooms uh, for about the next 20 minutes or so, and each room will have a topic um, for discussion. So you can choose the the room that, that has a topic that interests you most, and then you can join that. And next slide, Ed. thank you. So what are the topics? So we'll have four rooms. Um, one will be the integrity of the scholarly record, and you will find uh, one of our team members there, resourcing Crossref for future sustainability. This will be also the research nexus, and you'll find either uh, uh, Dominique or Patricia in that room, they're uh, ready to meet with you. And then also we'll have a room uh, for just general reflections on what you've heard today. And let's just uh, get the conversation going. And uh, Kathleen will be there, um, happy to chat with you. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to open up the rooms and then um, say about 20 minutes and then everyone can just come back to, to the main room. So bear with me just a moment, let me get this going here. And we'll be back, I guess back, uh, yeah, just 20 minutes. Here we go, hopefully this works. Excellent, the rooms are open, so please self-select and um, yeah, enjoy your conversations and we'll see you all back in the main room in 20 minutes. Excellent, okay, so quick feedback. Um, how did it go? So let's, Medora, how was, uh, any highlights from your, from your chat? Thanks, Rosa. Uh, so in our breakout room, it was mostly us Crossref colleagues hanging out and <laughs> we took that opportunity to reflect on today's sessions and how the meeting went. And it was so great to hear all the community updates. Um, so yeah, we were just reflecting on the annual meeting in our breakout room. Wonderful. Good stuff. It's always good to catch up and chat and you know, reassess. So thank you. And let's see, uh, Lucy, um, resourcing Crossref. Any highlights there? Yeah, we also had some more kind of discussion um, of things that uh, were top of mind for folks. Um, and then just how to get more involved. Uh, if you want to continue in these discussions, you can get in touch with um, any of us on the call uh, today. Or uh, if you're interested in more community participation or committee participation, um, or if you're looking for kind of more questions about how folks are navigating uh, their work with Crossref or their um, metadata questions, any kind of service questions, that another reminder that the community forum is a good place uh, to find answers and also ask other peer members in the space how they're navigating issues. Um, it's always a good resource. Excellent. And then ongoing discussion about, you know, that the fees are uh, particularly as, you know, as 
the PKP fate waiver is winding down and the, the GEM program has been spun up. What What is the kind of after effects of that? So um, it's a good brief conversation. Excellent, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you for that feedback. Good stuff. And let's see, we've got uh, the research nexus, either Patricia or Dominique. I'm not sure who led that, posted uh, that. That was me. Ah, I'm thank you. I'm not, I'm not Patricia. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that was that was a, a, a good discussion. Um, we, in the beginning, we went a little bit back to the basics and we wondered whether research nexus is important uh, for, for the community. Hmm. Um, the answer seems to be yes. <laughs> Um, but we also thought that uh, people thought that it would be it might be interesting to have more um, some case studies on um, how the relationships within the research nexus are used and for what and which bits of it uh, are perhaps uh, more important than others. Um, we talked a little bit about um, some obstacles uh, that may, may, may prevent um, our community to like, have the um, full and complete research nexus. Um, we talked a little bit about the systems uh, not being prepared sometimes um, for uh, changes, uh, for new identifiers, new types of relationships. Um, uh, also, uh, sometimes we might be asking people to, to put uh, a lot of effort into providing rich metadata and relationships um, in a situation where they are already uh, overwhelmed. Um, so again, that uh, took us back a little bit to to, um, to the beginning of the discussion, uh, wondering about um, uh, which parts should be perhaps prioritized. Um, uh, and uh, uh, we um, we also thought that people also thought that um, it's sometimes it just takes time for mm -hmm. everyone to get used to a new thing. So thank sure. you. Good discussion. Well, I want to talk about that. Uh after the meeting. Good stuff. And then uh, just general reflections. Uh, Kathleen? Um, yeah, most of us in there are located in the US. So we were just talking about, um, or in Canada, um, but in time zones where we did not attend session one. Um, so we were just discussing, um, uh, taking a look at the recording, um, heard some good things about the community updates from session one. Um, and also the open scholarly infrastructure session, um, some interesting um, speakers in that. So I think we're all looking forward to getting our hands on the recording to, to watch that. But um, yeah, otherwise just kind of discuss casually um, some of the bits that we liked. Amanda French is now on board with books and um, is really excited to be part of the book working, uh, working group now. Um, she's convinced after um, Alice's uh, presentation, which we all agreed Alice is an amazing speaker, um, and got us very excited about something that perhaps we had not been excited about in the past. Um, so uh, yeah, just generally found it informative and look forward to those recordings that will be shared out. Excellent. Sounds like a lot of good, uh, a lot of good feedback there. Excellent. Good stuff. Thank you. All right. And there we have it. So, um, to wrap up, congratulations to the new board members. Uh, we're looking forward to your input and uh, contributions next year. I want to thank uh, all the speakers uh, from our community and thank you for sharing your, your stories. Uh, to all of the uh, uh, session speakers uh, and facilitators, thank you. We will have um, all the outputs shared. Oops. Yep, we'll have all the out outputs in about a week or so. And um, yes, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us today and uh, be well. See you next time. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks Rosa. Okay. Thanks. Thanks Rosa. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Hi -bye. guys, thanks a lot. Bye. So much Bye. everyone. Bye-bye. Have a lovely evening all day. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Thanks, Ahmed. <laughs>